hello am i audible yes yes sir you are audible yes okay Okay, let's just start this. Wait for this one more minute, and then we start. Sir, meanwhile, can you? Uh, I have a doubt uh, regarding week five question uh, practice assignment. Uh, okay, what is it? Uh, sir, uh, there is a question about the gradient. Uh, question number seven. Uh, I'm not able to understood that. Okay. Mm. Nitin, once Nitin joins, he'll be able to understand better. So what we'll do is, uh, I will start with week seven. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, once I complete week seven, maybe you can bring it up so that Nitin will be able to uh, address that particular question. So, mm -hmm. sir, you are, sir, you are doing the week seven, and Nitin sir is doing. Uh... The yeah, I will. Eight. Yeah, right. Correct. Yeah, I'll do week one, and uh, Nitin will finish it with week eight. Okay. Sir. Okay. So yeah. So once he comes, uh, you can join in some two three minutes. Like once week seven is done, you can bring up this uh, week five question, or depending on whether we want to complete week eight also, and then take up this question, it will do that. Okay. So let's just get started. So I don't have slides. Me for this particular thing. What I have instead is some kind of a notes which I'll upload after the session ends. So I'll quickly go over the notes. What you can do is uh, don't read the text that I share because there'll be like a lot of sentences here and there. And if you try to read those sentences uh, while I'm speaking, it will be disturbing. So uh, the better idea is to just listen to what I say and only look at the equations that are displayed, equations and images, right? Don't try to read anything that is shown on the screen because that will be quite confusing. Sure, sir, sure. Okay, so is the screen uh, visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, it is visible. OK. so. Uh, there, are this, there are four parts to this, so let me quickly go over it. Okay, so classification starts from when does it start? Yeah, from week seven only it starts. So classification starts from week seven, and the setting is pretty much same. So we have a data set x i y i. The only change is that while x i still belongs to some d dimensional space, the labels could either be zero one or minus one, right? So they are going to be discrete. Uh, in this case, so the so we are only going to look at binary classification, right? So add that here. That's important for uh, this course. Our main focus will be binary classification. So there there are going to be just two classes, zero one or minus one one. So a classifier H, right, is nothing but a function. You can look at it as a function that takes an input, a feature uh, or set of features corresponding to a data point. And it outputs a label, right? The label could be either zero or one. Okay, so that's zero or one, and in, in a, depending on what kind of convention you have chosen, it could be zero one or minus one one, right? But uh, the one is always fixed, right? So the one, whatever we call the positive class, that will always be one. What we call the negative class could be either zero or minus one. Uh, it's more appropriate to call it minus one, but depending on the application sometimes it's convenient to use the label zero rather than the label minus one. Okay, so and you mostly will be able to figure this out from the question that's being asked. So similar to regression, if you want to understand, uh, if you want to know how good a particular function is, so I recall that in in regression also you are ultimately learning a function h from feature space to label space. The only change in classification is that the label space is discrete. Okay, so that's the main difference. So the goodness of a classifier is measured using the zero one loss, right? Zero one loss is nothing but the average number of misclassification. So when you 
when you come across the term misclassification, it means a data point for which the model's prediction doesn't agree with the true label. So true label is yi, and the model's prediction is h of x. So if they don't agree, then that means your classifier has made a mistake, and you are going to count that as one strike or one hit against this classifier and count all such data points for which the classifier makes mistakes, then divided by the total number of data points. Right. So this is called the zero one loss. It's called that because the for an individual data point, the loss can either be zero or one. Right? So that's why it's called the zero one loss. Now that's the general picture of classification. Right. So now we come to a special kind of classifier called the linear classifier, just like we had in regression, right? So we focused on linear models, linear regression. Likewise, the first choice here is going to be a linear classifier because simply because of the fact that a linear function is the simplest kind of function that you can think of, right? So linear combination of the features. Just like in regression, you can think of the the weights w as signifying the importance of a feature. So for example, if you have a, we have, let's say, a two feature problem uh, with uh, x1 and x2 as the features, then w1 x1 plus w2 x2, right? So if you have something like this, then the w1 will tell you how important the feature x1 is, right? So w2 will tell you how important x2 is, so something like this. Right, so linear classifiers are a special class of classifiers. Again, there is this point I want you to note. H of x is not W transpose x, right? H of x, so when is H of x just W transpose x? Can I, and can I throw away this sign term and just say H of x is W transpose x? You can, yeah. Mm. Linear regression. Yeah, only for linear regression, right? So you can't do that for classification. So that's why we have to introduce the same. Always recall that in cla in classification, your uh, classifier outputs a label. Okay, so that's the reason we have a sign of W transpose X. So this again, depending on the convention, the sign could either be one zero or one minus one, right? So be uh, be aware of. What the convention is, please read the question carefully because you may get up, you may end up getting the right answer, and uh, because of not noting what the convention is, you you shouldn't like uh, losing, shouldn't end end up losing marks, right? So this will be explicitly specified in the question. Mm, these are points that I've already expressed, right? So one of these two will be the convention, and again. Mostly, this will also be specified. This equal to zero goes to which side? Mostly, it will go to the W transpose X greater than side. Okay, so if it is equal to zero, then that is going to be called a positive class. Again, convention, right? So there's nothing sacrosanct about calling it one. You could also call it zero, but again, that's how we choose to do it. Next, we come to what is called the geometric interpretation of. Uh, a linear classifier. So every linear classifier is going to divide your plane into two halves, right? And in the case of two features, x1, x2, right? Two feature problem, these these halves are called half planes, right? They they are called half planes. And in the case of RD, they are called half spaces. Okay, so the green corresponds to plus one or the positive class, and the red corresponds to minus one or zero or negative class. Okay, so the the best way of understanding this is any point here, if you take the dot product with W, it will be positive, right? If you take the dot product, the angle between W and that point will be acute angle, right? So the angle will be an acute angle. So W dot X will be positive. Now, on the other hand, any point on the boundary, right? This is called the decision boundary. Any point on the boundary, if you take the dot product, that will be zero. Right? That's why this thing is W transpose X equal to zero. And for any point that is on this side, the red side, 
the angle between w and that point will be obtuse right it will be more than 90 degrees therefore the dot product will be less than zero okay so that's how this we come up with this particular image uh, excuse uh, me sir uh, yeah uh, sir in practice uh, assignment seven question number two uh, the answer is uh, that when w transpose x is zero it is given as minus one in the practice assignment just now you told me that it should belong to the plus one class when the value is zero okay maybe for that particular uh, question the convention uh, practice assignment to a second and third second question okay i think i would the have is the convention for it yeah uh, okay of course okay, okay. okay. that sir has clarified in the live session itself that we can take on the either side on the positive okay, side okay. as well as on the yeah, yeah. Side. but uh, i if i'm fine. not mistaken i think we'll make i think we have made sure in the questions that uh, this particular confusion doesn't arise right so but uh, yeah okay. we will keep this in mind for future for future uh, maybe for the end sum uh, we'll stick to this particular convention greater than or equal to 0 okay sir, okay. Uh, sir uh, just a quick question sir yeah like this uh, line which is representing y equal to minus x like like what we have shown as w transpose x equal to 0 that is our decision boundary right yeah like yeah. on the right hand side is plus 1 on the left hand side is minus 1 right Right, but but this uh, arrow w, what does this represent? This represent the corresponding weight, right? Yeah, the weight vector corresponding to that classifier. Every so, linear classifier will have a weight. So w. Is there any special significance of uh, showing this at a line of you know 45 degree, uh, making an angle of 45 degree? Uh, no, 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 nothing like that. It's just uh, for a notation. It is just a notation, yeah. huh? Yeah, yeah. For convenience, I have drawn it uh, like this. Sir, can I? Can I? Sir, if this line is like 2x plus 3y is equal to 0, okay. so w is the coefficient 2 comma 3. Can I say like that? Like this is the perpendicular to that line? So let me write that down. If w... Uh, this this line, huh? this classifier line is 2x plus 3y is equal to 0, suppose. So 2x1 plus, let's use x1, x2. So that y is for ah. label, right? So Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, okay, sorry, sir. 2x plus 3x2 is equal to 0. Then this w is... 2 comma 3 vector joining origin to point 2 comma 3 that is perpendicular to this line yeah so you can look at this as w transpose x right so this will be ah, ah. 2 3 transpose uh, x1 x2 right right uh, so 2 3 is already transpose so i yeah. don't call it transpose so x1 x2 transpose so the weight vector in this case would be 2 3 okay right? So W transpose X equal to zero. Yeah, two, three will be the right. Yeah. So one subtle point, the slope of this. So this is a vector, right? So this is two comma three, right? Two in ah, the X. So the slope of this line is different. The slope of this line will be what? It will be minus two by three, right? Yes. Sir. Yeah. So the slope is a different thing, uh, but of course it's closely related to what the vector stands for. At least in this case yes, for a two D case. Yes. Sir. Yeah, so any other questions so far? Okay, so now uh, we go to, so once we have defined what one linear classifier is, then the next question that we ask is, okay, let's consider all these, all possible linear classifiers, put them in a, in a set, right? And that's what this H linear is. You put every possible linear classifier, put them inside a set. And now we are going to ask this, a similar question in, in, in the case of classification to the one that we asked in regression. So in the regression, what did we ask? We asked this question of minimizing the sum of squared errors and uh, what weight vector will minimize the sum of squared errors. That is the question we asked. Here we are asking the question, what is that weight vector which will minimize the zero one loss? Right? So it's the same kind of question, but the loss we are using is different. Okay. Unfortunately, unlike in the case of regression where we had a nice closed form solution, in the case of classification, we don't have a solution. Okay, or at least even if we have a solution, it's, it is it is hard, right? So there is this idea of NP hard and all that. So it's hard to find. May okay. I ask a question here? Yeah, yeah. Can you just briefly explain the N, NP hard problem? I mean, this has been mentioned many times, but I still keep forgetting. 
okay so i am i'm like see i am not a pdsa guy but uh, very roughly speaking there are two cl different classes of algorithms so one class of algorithms is called polynomial time which, which run, so if, which roughly takes uh, a polynomial of the order of a polynomial to run so for example if you have a for loop right mm -hmm. and uh, you want to find the sum of the elements in a list uh, so you, you say for for i in range of n you say sum equal to sum plus l of i right so it, you compute the sum of the elements of a list so that is that is a linear operation right so linear in the sense you take it, it requires n steps to find the sum of n elements okay so right. if you have a nested loop uh, let's say where you want to do something else you have to do n square operations right n iterations Correct. for the first and n set. so yeah so this this is called order of n square notation so with meaning order of n square is nothing but <coughs> roughly how many operations or iterate uh, operations i have to do so as to mm -hmm. compute something right so n n square these are all polynomial right so we say that these are okay. all polynomial time algorithms now there is a class of algorithms which are not polynomial time i'm, I'm very it's very crude right it's not the actual thing but yes, okay. so basically np is can i uh, add a couple of points Cut. yeah yeah that's okay so np is non deterministic polynomial time right so you don't know whether it can be solved in polynomial time right okay uh, so for example merge sort earlier uh, sorting didn't have a polynomial time algorithm but over time people figured out and now it's not a np hard problem anymore it's a p which is polynomial time right but there are a lot of problems like you know vertex cover or uh, you know most efficient route in terms of salesman traveling problem you would have heard right these are all they do not have a uh, polynomial time algorithm yet nobody knows right Mm -hmm. uh, so those and there is some other specification as to what becomes the NP hard because everything in the class of NP should be reducible to a NP hard problem in polynomial time. There are many complications. Then it becomes NP complete and all of it. But the thing is, these class of problems do not have a polynomial time solution, right? Yet, uh, and there is one interesting idea about these NP hard problems are if I give you the answer. I can verify whether it is correct or not in polynomial time, but I can't solve it in polynomial time. Right? Right. For example, if I give you factorization problem to one large number broken down into two primes, and I say, check whether this is the right answer, you can quickly multiply and check and tell me. But if that number had to be broken down into two primes, you won't be able to do it in polynomial time. Right? So NP harder basically they are still they can you can check the answer in polynomial time but you cannot solve it in polynomial time yet right along with some small other specifications right there may be solutions which like for example there are many things like that most practical problems are np hard only because there is no like real solution all your traveling salesmen route optimization vertex cover all of the satisfiability all of those are uh, np hard problems okay okay so thanks for the, yeah so this is a pretty hard problem right so as also mentioned in this case what will happen is to give to, if, if someone gives me a w i can check that it's whether it works or not right i can can find out what the loss is and uh, see how well it does but coming up with a w or actually finding such a w is hard right so it's that's one thing i have linked this We'll go to Wikipedia and maybe you can read up more. Okay. Right? Okay. All right. So Thank they you. are linear classifiers. So we, the reason we introduce linear classifiers is because it's they are it's a very powerful. Uh, it's the simplest one, and yet it's quite powerful. And we'll be seeing them in weeks nine, week ten, uh, so on. Right. So we'll we'll see more of these in upcoming weeks. So now moving back. Again, there are too many sentences here, so don't try to read the sentences. I'll just highlight what you need to focus on. K nearest neighbors, as you know, is like the simplest of all classification algorithms. So the basic idea is that you ask your neighbors and make a prediction based on the information that they give. Right? So the idea is that 
if you want to predict the label of a point, then it's a good, it's a good, chance, it's a good idea to ask those around you first, and then uh, come to a consensus based on what opinions they give you, right? So that's the basic idea. So if you are given a data point x, right? If you are given a data point x, what you do is this is the first step in the algorithm. You compute the distances of all the points in the data set from this point x, right? So if there are 100 data points in your training data set, you would end up computing 100 distances, OK? The next step is you sort all these distances in ascending order, right? Small to big. And if you want to look at your k neighbors, then they are going to be k nearest points, right? So you, you pick k the smallest distances from this list, and you ask each one of your neighbors uh, what their opinion is, whether they're going to vote for class 1 or class 0, and then find that find that class which is the most popular, right, or most populous. And you return that as a label. OK, so that's the basic idea, very simple algorithm. So there are two hyperparameters that are of interest. Hyperparameter, we call it something that is not learned. It's, it is something that you fix. OK, so when these, these can be fixed for determined by cross-validation. Right? We have looked at cross-validation last week. So you can do that. Two hyperparameters, one is the number of neighbors. And uh, the other one is the distance metric to you. So how do I know who my neighbor is? Typically, we use Euclidean distance, but there are other metrics that you can use. There is one subtle point concerning the number of neighbors. So k is typically chosen to be an odd number. Okay, So you choose three neighbors or you choose five neighbors. You don't choose six neighbors for the simple reason that in the unlikely event that you choose nice. Yeah, there is a tie, right? If there is a tie. Then maybe like three of them are one and three of them are zero, right? So you'll have to break your tie and arbitrarily. And uh, this will not arise if k is odd, right? If you have five neighbors, then whichever way you look at it, three are three have to be one or two have to be zero, or the other way around, right? Or one is zero, four are minus one. Or oh, sorry, one is zero, four are one. So things like that, right? So this side breaking business so you won't fall into that trap right so case generally odd uh yeah and then the distance metric right so we'll only look at two in our course we are only looking at two one is the euclidean distance so this is the l2 uh, norm so norm of x minus y is the distance between x and y so this is the usual euclidean distance you are all you're all aware of this the other one is the manhattan distance right so you recall in yesterday's session, the today or the day before, we were talking about this lasso, right? So the what you add as penalty for lasso, the same L1 norm, if you use it in the capacity of distance, you get the Manhattan distance, right? So same idea, uh, underlying idea, but different uses. OK, so this is. How you choose k, again, you cross-validate for k, right? You try out different values. And uh, whichever value of k returns the lowest error on your date, on your validation set, or in cross-validation, whichever gives you the lowest value of k, you choose that. All right, so one more point. When k is equal to 1, your decision boundary is going to be very rugged, right? It's going to be all over the place. That's because you're asking your friend, right? And if, for every every one of these data points, his or her friend is going to give a totally different picture, right? So it's going to be a very noisy uh, kind of a boundary. On the other hand, if k is very large, the boundary is smooth, right? Smooth. So don't worry about the blue curve. The blue dashed curve is something else. Uh, KNN's decision boundary is this black color line. OK, so as, as you ask more and more neighbors, you kind of get a roughly more uniform response, right? So you're not going to be biased by a small number of neighbors. So larger the value of K, uh, more stable is your response. But that also has its own downsides. OK, so you have to settle for some intermediate value of K. 
So few more points, uh, advantages and disadvantages, very easy to implement. So, and it's also interpretable. Interpretable by that I mean, if you predict a particular label for a test point and someone asks you, why did you make that prediction? You can clearly say that, you know, I asked five of my neighbors, three of them said yes, two of them said no, right? So you can, so you can convince someone who asks you, why you arrive if someone asks you why you arrived at a decision you you can explain to them right so you have some basis of uh, decision making and you can explain to this particular person why you made the decision so that's what roughly we mean by interpretability okay so these are two advantages but the dis disadvantages are uh, they outweigh the advantages in the case of KNN. so there is no model i hope you you are clear about what this means so in the case of linear regression, if you recall, we have a model, right? So what is the model in the case of, uh, or so can you can someone tell me, tell me what the model is, what the model is for linear regression and what does it mean that yes, I can sir. throw away the data? What do I mean by that? Beta zero plus beta one X plus error. That is the simplest model or in our term W, w transpose X I plus error. Okay, so that's the model. Now, in, in what I am saying by this, this line is that in linear regression, once you learn the weight vector, you can throw away the data, right? So once the W is learned, I no longer need the data to make a prediction. So that's, that's, what, that, that's the advantage of learning a model, right? Here, there is no such thing. For every prediction that you have to make, you have to keep the data in your memory and uh, you have to compute the distances, right? So the result yeah, is computation. It's the same training data, training data. Yeah, you have to have the training data with you at all times. Uh, sir, one conceptual question comes to mind here, sir, at this point. When we say yeah. that we throw away the data and, you know, and then we start playing with model, right? But the, but the beauty of machine learning models are that they learn over a period of time, right? So if we have, uh, they also learn over a period of time with the help of new data coming. So if you are throwing away the data, then how the model will learn, sir? Yeah, so the that point is a bit subtle, right? So that is called fine tuning. So once you learn a model on a data set, what you can do is you don't need to have the same data set around with you. Once new data comes, there's a process that take, the term is called fine tuning, right? So assume that you have a, you have something that's working more or less well, and then you fine tune it, right? So it's like you tune the radio knob and then so that you are able to hear more properly. So that process of training, a, using a trained model on a data set. Does, it, is mean that, does it mean that we revisit the model over a period of a time, like at certain interval, we revisit the model? We revisit the model using a different data set, right? So I don't need to use the same data set. Right? Okay. I have learned already what I can learn from a given data set. Okay. Right? Now I'm going to use, now I'm going to make the model better by, you know, fine tuning it on a different data set. So that can happen, but you don't need to keep the data around in the case of regression. So that's the okay. basic. I have a question on the <clears throat> images you have put there. Yeah, yeah. On the left, it is k is equal to one. That right. means there is only, um, um, one class or how is that? Because here you mentioned as 100 but the graphs the lines that you show are only two one is a solid line other is a dashed line ah right see the dashed line forget about it it's uh it's it corresponds to some optimal classifier which we don't need to know for this course right so mm -hmm. uh, i couldn't delete that line because i copied okay. this from no, a textbook right so that no. forget about that the other the actual decision boundary is the black line so when I say k equal to one, what I'm doing is I'm asking my nearest neighbor Only for one. making a prediction. Only one you are asking. Yeah, I am just asking my closest. Uh, the person next door is all that I ask. I don't okay. go for anyone else. For k equal to hundred, I ask hundred. I ask the entire flat or apartment complex. Okay. Right. Okay. So that's what I. Okay. So any other questions or shall we move on to d trees? So K represents the number of neighbors I am asking. Yeah, K and K and N represents how many neighbors you are querying before making a decision. Okay. Uh, so one quick question. 
yeah one of the problems it said k is equal to 1 and it is considered as uh, you know the neighbor being the self like uh, the point itself the data point itself so does uh -huh. it mean that each and every single individual point uh, so it, it is nothing but just uh, memorizing the data isn't it yeah that's a good point so this question was there in last quiz i think it's one of the mock questions right uh, in one of the practice uh, oh, practice in one question is it yeah. okay okay right so i think we asked it uh, in the mock in last year's quiz also see mm -hmm. uh, what happens is uh, every so how we arrive at this decision boundary is as follows we take every point in this 2d space in this plane okay mm -hmm. and we ask what is the point closest to it in the training data set so this point right so the whatever my cursor is pointing to if it coincides with one of the training data points then the closest neighbor happens to be that training data point okay okay so for k equal to 1 the training error is going to be zero in that in that sense uh, sorry not training error the uh, right so if if i have k equal to 1 then my zero one loss on the training data set is going to be zero yes right so yeah you are correct in saying that you are memorizing the data set. yeah and so one more question when we say uh, initially said for example there are 100 points so the distance that we are calculating is like you know we are calculating 100 distances but isn't it like if i'm taking point data point a and i'm trying to find the distance from that point to all other points on all other 99 data points Ah uh, no, right. So we are not doing that. So see, so how there does is that work, sir? Because some confusion. I have okay, so see. there is there is this idea of you have uh, you have a data point. Let's call it. So okay, let me let's take the case of a one-dimensional case, right? One one D problem. So I have a training data set that is made up of a one. Um, the table might be easier to understand, so let me draw a table. So this is x, this is y, and there's nothing. So let's say one is labeled one, and zero is labeled one, and uh, this um, everything to the right of zero, let's say, is labeled one. So, uh, Three is labeled one, and then you have three more data points. Okay, minus one is labeled zero. Um, minus two is labeled zero. Minus three is also labeled zero. Now, when you are when you are given a new data point to test, okay. So let's say the new data point that is given for which you have to find the label is x equal to four. So for four, what you what you do is it doesn't matter whether four is in your training data set or not. What you are trying to do is given uh, some yes, sir, got it. So basically, we are talking about the test data point and the distance of the test data point to the training points that we have. Exactly, right? So you'll have uh, to compute so it in yeah. distance, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, so shall we move on to decision trees? Any other questions regarding KNS? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let us move. Yeah, so uh, let's quickly go over D trees. Sir, tree. sir, yeah. sir, 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 sorry, sorry, extremely sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I had one more question regarding this uh, classifier boundary. There's yeah. one question in the practice assignment. Uh, it's question number six. There are certain data points that are given X and Y. And they are asking what is the best value. Uh, so in the decision tree, the reason I'm uh, asking this question before we start the topic. So while you're explaining, you can just explain that too. So the number doesn't seem to. Uh, how do I share the question number with you? It's practice assignment seven, question six. It's that Karthik. It's that. Uh, in fact, I think you responded saying there's uh, anything uh, like what is the value where you get a pure set? Okay, the two to three. Yeah. Ah, two to three. Uh, uh, yeah, it is. Uh, no, it is like. Uh, how many possible integer values can we take? 
Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. So let me come to that. I'll which maybe week yes, is sir. this? I forgot which week is this. This is week seven only, the decision tree thing. Practice assignment question okay. six. So I'll go through decision trees. If it gets if your question gets answered, okay. If not, just uh, let me know. We can go on. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, so in the decision tree, you have a sequence of questions and they're all arranged in the form of a tree, right? It's a binary tree. Binary tree has a node will have exactly at most, right, or rather at most two children, right? So there'll be a left child or a right child. In our case, there'll be exactly two children, right? There will be a left child and the right child for every parent. Okay, there are like two types of nodes. What one is called an internal node, or other name for it is a question node. And uh, each question node will result in two children, right? And for the other kind of node is called a leaf. Leaf is basically one which is where you have reached term like the terminal point of the tree, and there are no more questions to ask, right? That's a leaf. And every leaf will be associated with a label. Okay, so how do you find the label associated with the leaf? You you look at all the data points in the leaf, and uh, just like what we did in KNN, not KNN, yeah. Where, no, not KNN. Where did we do this? Uh, yeah, like, like like just like what we did in KNN, right? So you look at the data points in a leaf, whichever is the most populous or maximum uh, occurring class label that you assign as the label of leaf. For example, if let's take this particular case and an example, you have L1 and uh, the labels in of the data points in L1 are 11100. So in this case, L1's label will be one. Okay, the leaf L1 will have a label one because there are five data points and uh, out of them, three of them have label one. So that will be the label of that leaf. Okay, so that is a general structure of a D3. Now there's too much of text here, so don't even try to read this. So typically what happens I have a question in this. Yeah. Uh, the Q1 node is called the root node and also the internal node, right? Yeah, that's all. Yeah, it's an internal node. Additionally, it's also the root node. Okay. 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 So at each at each stage, at every internal node, you ask a question, right? The question is typically of the form feature less than value or feature less than or equal to value. It, it's, it depends on again a convention, right? So We'll give it explicitly, so don't worry about this. Now, depending on the question, you will partition your data set into two parts, right? So there'll be a DS and a DNO, right? So DS will go to the left, DNO will go to the right. right? Generally, we'll have this yes and no given to you, but if yes and no are not given, then take left as DS and right as DNO. Okay. Again, that's another convention, but we'll have to follow these things. Okay, so that is what happens. That's what I've written here. Right, so how do you choose a good question? So you choose a good question by looking at how. Yeah, so can you, Ankit, can you mute? There's some noise from there. Uh, sorry, sorry. So uh, how do you decide if a question is good or not? Depends depending on how pure the leaves are. Sorry, not the leaves. How pure your children are after the split is done. So do you need any explanation or are you clear about this? I think you must be clear. Uh, sir, then. Through some, some, you know, some light on derivation, of the, not derivation, like how this formula we have arrived. If uh, that's this, if that's possible quickly, then it's fine. Otherwise, we can discuss after this. Like uh, this is the formula of entropy, right? Yeah, yeah. And and then P represent the proportion of one. Mm. Yeah. So how this formula uh, that this for uh, E P you know equal to minus P log. See, P, how this okay. See, entropy as as such is borrowed from information theory, right? So mm -hmm. I you have to maybe go through some which is okay. Which is then, then, which then is we can proceed. Yeah. Actually, uh, when Shannon was figuring out a way of like, I'll, like, how do you con like send signals without loss of information? And he borrowed information theory from 
a way of understanding how pure or impure it will be, how much will you lose information. Uh, he borrowed it from thermodynamics. Basically, that's the history. Okay, no problem, sir. Then okay, right. So, see, intuitively, you have to understand how you we'll, we'll, we'll we'll memorize this formula and proceed through, please. Ah, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so entropy of one is undesirable. Is that the would that yeah, be yeah. a right way to say? Yeah, yeah that, correct. So, see the the ge geometry of this graph you can always remember, right? So, for example, yes. closer to zero and closer to one is desirable because that shows how pure your uh, node is, right? So, smaller the value of p or the larger the value of p, more pure your node is going to be. Now, value of p around 0.5 means uh, it node is impure, right? So, ma maximum impurity occurs at t equal to 0.5 and t is the proportion, right? Yeah. So one way to think about why we need pure nodes is, uh, so let's think about it this way, right? So finally, what do we want to do? We want to make a decision, right? What is a classification? Right. Classification is a decision, and I want my, uh, I want each clarity in making my decision. Yeah, right? so, each, each node should be as pure as possible. Yeah. So the, if let, let me ask this question to you all. So I'm I'm giving you hundred balls. Right, all all of them put in a bag. Right, fifty of them are red, fifty of them are green. Okay, I'm giving you these hundred balls. All of them are there in one basket. Now, I don't tell you what to do with these hundred balls, but what will you do? Like typically, if you, if you take a person at random, what do you think that person is going to do? Fifty, fifty. You have like all the time. And try to segregate by either color or size or something like that. Whatever. Yeah, right? Something like so. If we assume that, uh, say, size is, they are all of the same size. Then the and the person has all day to uh, spend, and nothing else to do. No YouTube, nothing. So the probably what that person will do is put fifty balls of red color into say one new basket, and other balls into another basket. Right. So that's intuitively what you will do. So none of us like impure uh, combinations right so we we try to ensure that there is as much clarity as possible in our notes so one measure of this impurity is right so purity opposite is uh, we don't measure purity we measure impurity right because uh, that's what we want to minimize in some sense and entropy is the measure of this. So remember this graph. That's going to be always useful. And uh, what what is entropy of zero? Is it defined or is it undefined? It is take. It is take, assumed to be taken as zero. Correct. Right. It's assumed to be zero. Uh, you can think about it as a limiting process. The closer you come to zero, the entropy at zero is going to be defined as zero. Same for entropy at one. Okay, even though log zero is not defined, we are still going to, you know, using the limiting idea, limit idea, we are going to treat it as zero. So that is regarding entropy. Now, sir, any please, questions? Sir, please hear the uh, probability of positive class. Ah, yeah, proportion of points that belong to the positive class, and you can also treat it as what is the probability that a point I pick from a from a node is going to belong to class one. Okay. It, so that will come if, out to be same. Okay. If probability is one or either zero, the entropy is zero. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. So one other point that I want you all to notice is the following. What is E of one minus P? Oh, I think it's I the see. same formula, equal to E of P. Yeah. Right. So what does this mean? Whether you take P as the proportion of ones in a node or p as the proportion of zeros your entropy calculations are going to remain unaffected okay okay, okay so it's actually an interesting thing because uh, what you care about is purity of a node you are not talking about okay you are pure only if you have class 1 or you are pure only if you have class 0 no we are not saying this you are pure if you have all the data points that belong to the same class right so yes. purity is agnostic to Class labels, right? So that's the important point. Asil, just one, one quick question, sir. Like, while we are classifying these points into different class, like 0 or 1, 
So whatever ex examples we have discussed so far, uh, we have taken two variable cases, right? So when we are, whenever we are asking the question feature less than equal to theta, we are using only one feature, right? Right. right. So in practical life, is it possible to club? Uh, can we ask question involving two or three features at a time? Typically, this is not done. Yeah. So, so can you mute him and then we? Yeah. Yes, sir. So can we ask question in? Yeah. So. Typically, we don't because uh, if you want to ask a question that involves multiple features, they can always be converted into a sequence of feature less than value questions. So, for example, if you want to ask questions of the form f1 less than v1 and f1, f2 less than, or let's say greater than or equal to v3, 2, or things like this, right? If you want to ask questions on Multiple features. I can always ask. Can no, always can be, can be always less than theta, sir. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. So we can. Not a strict rule, but anyway, yeah. So if you want to ask question, a question like this, you can always break this down into f1 less than v1 in one node. If it is true, then you ask another. You insert another internal node and say that it's f2 less than or equal to v2. So you can always do that. Right, so that is the idea. So you are as, as a good practice, we have to ask only one feature, involving only one feature. Yeah, these are binary split, uh, more of binary splits, right? So okay. and that's that's that will do the job for us. Thank you. So, sir, uh, sir, we have to uh, uh, remember this formula or which e e entropy formula? Yeah, sir. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Have... Okay. Yeah, so you have to remember, and uh, you also have to remember another thing that the log is always with respect to base two. Okay, so okay, 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 okay. This we won't give you, right? You have to. Uh, it's like not too hard if you think about it. It's uh, p uh, log p and my one minus p log one minus p. Yeah, so if you want yeah. to stretch this, you can also think about this as an expectation, right? The expectation over the expectation of this function it is mm -hmm. log. Uh, P, right? So, uh, no, no, I don't want to go there because I, I myself, I'm not very sure about this. So, anyway. okay, okay, okay. okay. So, let's move on. Uh, don't, don't worry about the expectation part, right? Just memorize this. It will, it's enough. Okay. Okay. So, intro, entropy. Once you know how pure a node is or how, how impure a node is, you can go ahead and calculate how good a question is, right? So, remember, we are interested in asking. Good questions, right? So, a good question is one which has maximum information gain, right? So, information gain and information gain is nothing but uh, decrease in entropy, right? So, if I ask a good question, how much clarity do I get? So, the greater the decrease in entropy, uh, the better the question. Uh, may I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was this one question, uh, I don't know, is it in graded or otherwise, where uh, we were supposed to look at true and false statements. So one statement said that uh, as we increase uh, P from 0 to 1, entropy increases. But then it, that's not strictly true because as we move from 0 to 1, it increases and then decreases. Uh, that is correct. So that could have actually been given as a false statement. Yeah, but it was given as a true statement. Is it? Uh, if I'm not yes, sure. sir, even even when I was uh, doing that, even I felt the same. But I did answer not select it. it. Yeah, I did not uh, select that choice. Yeah, because, because I even I was doubtful. Which was this? Which one Actually, I think it's in I, graded or. Uh, I think it's graded only. It's graded only. I think. Yeah. So I'm. I mean, I just want to be clear because sometimes conceptual questions, we get confused in such instances. So as we're moving yes, from sir. zero to one, uh, we can't say entropy is really increasing. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So I'm surprised because this question was there in the last term also, and we should have corrected it by now if it had been wrong. So yeah, if entropy increases, sorry, if P increases from 0 to 0.5, then we can definitely say that. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. But it was not stating 0 to 0 0.5. Okay. Yeah, they there is, mentioned there is one in the graded assignment, which has four options. And the correct 
correct option is basically P is equal to 0.5 corresponds to maximum impurity, right? Uh, that's one I can see. Uh, there's no other entropy question. Maybe there's in practice assignment. Let me just check. No, it was available as one of the options, I think. It mentioned as that entropy will keep increasing straight from 0 to 1. I mean. No, but those options are not correct. The answer was only P is equal to 0.5 no, is correct. As yeah. part of the answer, it was also mentioned it as correct, I think. Even I was wondering, but then... No. Uh, I don't no. remember the question. Uh, just open just different? open and check, na? How, how, how much time does it take? Yeah, I'm also checking uh, if it I... It is not correct. Only one option is correct. P yeah, is that's only one option is correct. P is equal to 0. 0.5. Yeah. Uh, the options are wrong. Okay, anyway, it's clear. maybe I'll go through okay, it. I'll see how it's clear back. now, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, yeah, now we measure the information gain. How do we do that? So, we look at this is the convention I'm using here. P is parent, L is left child, and R is right child. So, you calculate the entropies of the parent and the children. So, E, P, E, L, E, R. And you look at the proportion of data points that go into the left node, right? So, you look at, so there are 100 points to begin with in the parent say 70 go here and 30 go there then gamma will be 0.7 okay so it's number of nodes sorry number of data points that go into the left child divided by total number of data points in that you have to begin with right so that's gamma and uh, sorry what is gamma uh, i mean that's the formula but what is gamma gamma is uh, how many points go into the left node divided by the total that's number it. of points to begin with. Proportion, proportion. Okay, that's yeah. all. That's all gamma is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Okay, so so why do we need gamma? We need gamma because we need to take a weighted entropy, right? So see, entropy calculating the entropy of each uh, node is one thing, or each of the children is one thing, but how do you combine that to give a single number? So this is what is called the weighted entropy of the leaves uh, sorry not leaves uh, weighted entropy of the children okay up to children so this is how you compute the weighted entropy and gamma is the weight for the left child and uh, 1 minus gamma is the weight for the right child yeah any questions regarding this information gain formula so this information gain is for the uh, so it is a gini value it's a gini or Ah, uh, no, no. So the guinea index is 2p into 1 minus p. That's not different. for uh, this our course. So okay. is, in our course, we have not talked about guinea index. Sir. Yeah, only the entropy, right? So let's yes. stick to entropy alone. Yes. Okay. Uh, sir, so this information gain is for the parent, right? Is for the question. Yeah, right. For the question. So it's the parent and children together. You have some values, right? The entropies, they all go together in deciding how good the question is. So the IG is associated with the question. And of course, yeah, for at that parent, right? So the question you're asking at that parent. Okay. Yes, okay. Okay. Uh, sir, I have a yeah. quick question. Yeah. To calculate entropy, for example, if I have to calculate entropy for left and right. So Based on the formula, I need the information, the breakup of uh, the purity and impurity in terms of uh, the leaf nodes for L and R to calculate entropy, right, sir? Uh, you need the value of P, right? The proportion of ones in each of these nodes. Yeah, so the leaf leaf nodes, basically, how many will go to, uh, you know, the leaf, maybe one, uh, zero, for right. each of these child nodes? Ah, child nodes, right? Better to call them child nodes and not leaves because they they may they may not yet be leaves. Yeah, yeah, okay, sure. But sir, is there any other way? Because one of the mock question is asking about you know the right node, but the breakup isn't uh, clearly given. So I think maybe I'm missing out on some information. Ah, uh, okay. Really so that know. that's the catch in the question. You have to figure out what the breakup is based on the okay. data given, right? So you will be able to. So the basic formula is this, right? See, if you have, uh, if you have p positive, okay, p is will confuse us again. So if you have hundred, hundred nodes in parent and uh, say sixty of them are positive, forty of them are negative, and you end up with 
some split right i don't know what the split is but in the left child you end up with say 40 notes right 40 notes out of which um, say 20 of them are positive and 20 of them are negative right now can you compute how many 60 then 60 right so 60 40 20 uh, 40 20 right so you will you will be able to compute uh, the other quantities depending on basic arithmetic right so the total number of data points is conserved so 100 equal to 40 plus 60 the total number of positive data points is conserved so 60 equal to 20 plus 40 likewise the total number of negative data yes. points will also be conserved okay but the split can be anything right sir for r it could be 40 20 30 30 something like that it, so yeah, this split could... isn't given so that how, how do we arrive at that why should it be 40 20 for r can, why can't it be 30 30 because that, that number will not match the 60 40 number has to match no, once no, it 30, comes 30, to 30, lr r it depends on what lr r is doing there no ravi in, in p there are 100 data points right that is clear that so is 60, clear 60 r plus one and 40 r minus one right no, so that, is clear, Gagap, 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 sir, that is clear you say 60 on to the left side 40 on to the no, right no. side L, okay 40 on to the right side see l and r are splitted from p right uh, that's why the positive and negative uh, the uh, negative numbers should be matched like okay l and r are there leaves or are there nodes does it matter does it matter nodes actually? if they are nodes then the node actually can lead to another set of leaves and that is from there that we are calculating the entropy, isn't it? L and no, 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 no. Can you only calculate. No, 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 no. See, you are calculating entropy at every stage before you move down. Okay. Now this P and L and right is there, right? So here, let's say you have four questions. The way this is basically structured is you can ask four questions here. Any, you are, let's say you have choice of four questions to ask. Which question should I ask? Right? You calculate the entropy at P. And let's say based on that question, it splits into left and right. Then you calculate the entropy at left and right and calculate the overall information gain. That is for one question. Similarly, you do it for all the three, all the four and say, Achha, which one is giving me the maximum entropy gain, information gain or entropy loss, right? And you choose that. Next, you again at the next node, you do that till the time you reach the node where either you say it's enough, I'm going to stop here because it's pure enough or you get something which is 100% pure. Fair enough. When we are actually calculating the entropy, we are looking at P, isn't it? Probability, uh, uh, rather proportion, whichever proportion. you want to call that. Correct. Proportion, okay. Uh, we are calculating it as uh, uh, using the formula P into whatever that is and one minus P, whatever Correct. that is. Correct. Okay. okay, that's what we are calculating. What is the P that is there at L and R? Again, say it proportion of ones. No. Proportion of ones. Proportion of ones at that node L or at node R, correct? It is yeah. not. Not about what is it up there at the parent. More, all three. Na? You need all three. I need all three, but the one <laughs> at the parent is not determining what is there at the child. That is what I'm saying. Yeah, the question so, is determining what is there at the child. Left and right. Correct. But whatever is at P, let's say there are 100, 100 ones at, uh, 100 ones at P and 100 zeros at uh, P, then it has to go into these two buckets in whichever way. Once it goes to the buckets, what question is asked at the child determines what happens to the P over there. What comes to the child and what is determined at the child are not the same. That is what I mean to say. It need not be 40 for the right, though the number of uh, the proportion that is coming as 60 of the 100, it need not be 40, 20 because it could be based on what the question at R correct, is. Correct, 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 correct. Uh, what the, no, what the question at R is, mm -hmm. what the question at P is. What the question at P determines what is coming to R. Yes. And what is coming to left. Yeah. What is the proportion that I calculated R? What, whatever, it, whatever, whatever comes there, whatever comes there, that is the proportion P. That uh, proportion, no, no. Is, Vasu, that proportion uh, is for P or that proportion is for R? How can that, it be the same I for both P and R? See, just uh, look at the table on the top, right? At P level, what is the proportion of ones? Was Just assume this is P correct for now. It, it is 0 0.6. 0 0.6, right? Yeah. 
sorry to interrupt here does the p value and gamma i mean gamma value both are same no 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 both are different right let's do an example right let's do an example yes yeah, yes better to do an example so it's better to do with one example so have you done us 2020 based on something or it is fixed that's the i think we need to write out it's right it is it is determined at the child level is what i'm actually saying how no, no, it's determined at the parent level then what is the point in actually calculating for the child i can yeah, actually do it seeing, directly no no you are seeing when i ask this question when i move to the left child and right child compared to the parent what kind of gain am i getting is l and le left and right purer than p or not okay was so let me le, le, let me go for a different let's go for a class where the heights are being determined heights or weights take anything it's okay let's say the first parent we are cutting off at 150 cm okay we get 60 and 40 what is my next question One fifty is the cutoff. Okay. I have hundred students. Ah. Uh, of the hundred, sixty are on the uh, right side. That is, they are more than one fifty. Forty are less than one fifty. Hmm. Now they go to the left and the right. Fair hmm. enough. Hmm. Now, what is the P at uh, left left side where the forty students are? No, no. That you are basing this on one question, right? It see the P there is. See if you are looking for. uh if you say that i want uh, you want people who are all healthy versus people who are not healthy okay and you have two questions okay you have height you have weight you have something else you have height and weight to determine something like that right now when you are for that you will use height and weight to see how you will splitting and are you getting something which are healthy students versus less healthy students or whatever what whichever way you want to say it one question if you have one question you will not do all this right the question at the next level is going to be determined on <clears throat> what high I actually i am taking as less than 130 if i put it as it will give me one proportion if i ask the next question as less than 140 it will give me another proportion if i put it as 120 okay. it is where are you proportion. where are you asking that question at l no you are you first initially asked it at p i already asked it at p correct next it is not the end of the chain we said we determined that l and r are the nodes not the leaves it can be low it can be leaves or it can be nodes whatever it depends no, no, on what no, you want no, no, no. then there is nothing to be calculating at the leaf no leaf is zero it is already done leaf is one it is already done no no so here okay in your example what are you measuring what do you want finally you tell me no no, no you no. tell me what do you want what are you trying to measure what are you trying to split on basis if it's one question you don't need to go through all this you just say i want to split versus that precisely my point precisely my point the second set of questions that are going to ask be asked at l and r are going to determine what the entropy of l and r are going to be no l and all l and r are already determined based on what you have already asked at p ravi now l and r are already formed okay what is the entropy at l then if it Masu, is zero Masu. For if it is zero, it is already determined as zero. If it is one, it is already determined on the r and the no, one. No, that's it. Your 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 splitting is done. If need, you get no, one zero, what is the information gain that I got? No, you got hundred percent information gain. That is at that level. That's the only level that is there. No, no, I'm yes. saying you are basing everything on one maybe question should, or what? Maybe maybe you should listen to Shrivel. Vasu, here when you say we already have got L and R, so when. we already have information about the proportion that we have in l and r that these two uh, th that information will help us to calculate entropy for p am i right correct correct if i want to calculate entropy for l what do i need you are not entropy at p nahi you are not you are calculating entropy at p you are calculating entropy at l you are calculating entropy at r what you get from all these three is information gain i know i know my question is if i if 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 i want to calculate entropy at p i need the break up in terms of proportion for the data points that go to left and the proportion of data points that go to r am i right no you don't you just need the proportion of ones in p look now you what is the proportion okay if in p? when i say ones in p okay ones in p then automatically that is bifurcating into left and right yeah so right? no i'm saying forget about left and right now you would know the forget about left and right you have the number of you have the p in uh, you have the proportion of ones in p it is 0.6 yes 
correct mm -hmm. from this example i think this whole argument can be laid to rest if we probably if uh, sir probably solves this yes, question yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah. things will there yeah, be a lot yeah. of light thrown on the whole issue correct, maybe yeah, a lot yeah. of the doubts would be probably cleared yeah, yeah i agree yes, you jotted down so many calculations so let him calculate here yeah. yeah so see this i mean i have to agree with wasu because it's the correct one so uh, there's no second thought about that so see the entropy is defined for a node okay the entropy has there is no entropy for a split there is only information gain for a split there is the, the entropy is only associated with the node so stop if, if you stop looking at it as entropy and look at it as impurity that things might become clear right so you want to know how impure a node is if you want to know how impure a node is all that you need to do is look at how many positive examples are there look at how many negative examples are there right so this particular node here p right i am not asking what i am not asking any question at all here right so for the, for the moment you can you can even uh, forget the question right i have some node with me at some stage in my decision tree you can even think about p as the root node now what is the impurity of this node okay I, how do i compute the impurity i compute the proportion of positive examples 0.6 is the proportion so for 0.6 the impurity is let's say 0.9 right now this is 90% impure that's all right at this stage i am only concerned with the impurity now my whole business is how can i reduce this impurity i can reduce this impurity by asking a good question okay so what is the question question is now a question comes the moment a question comes you start talking about a split right so you you split it into a left node and you split it into a right node now this will partition your data set into two parts some will go here some will go there now what have you done you end up with two nodes which have different set of impurities and the impurity of a node depends only on the proportion of points that are there in that node it has nothing to do with the question associated with that node or what question led to it or what question will lead what questions you can ask from here or not right so the impurity of a node depends purely on the node it's a property of the node and it's not the property of a question are we clear about that any questions can you repeat it see the the I'll just write it down the the impurity of a node because i call it the impurity of a node is a property of the node right it is not a property of the question yeah okay so it's not a property of the question the node the impurity of a node exists before you ask a question it will it will remain the same even after you ask the question you could ask a uh, hundred different questions from this point right that is not going to affect the impurity of p because p is already having an impurity of say 0.9 okay how will asking a question change the impurity of p right so it can't yes, change yeah. okay sir, just a just a clarifying question sir here when we yeah. are saying that impurity of a node is property of the node and when we are calculating impurity so here it means impurity at p impurity at l impurity at r separately right yeah there are three different impurities yes got it and this gamma sir while calculating the information gain i am just jumping to gamma now so this gamma we calculate with respect to uh, you know number of data point at p or the number of data point which have been segregated among l and r the number of data points which have gone into r right it's it has so the gamma has nothing to do with positive negative it has it is only the proportion so out of 100 data points 40% of them fall into the left node 60% yes. fall into the right node correct so this this gamma will help me to calculate the information gain at p because of the question which i asked right the gamma will help you to calculate the in the information weight. gain information gain at p because of the question which i asked to segregate yeah. my data into uh, lnr right right even before that there's a step before that so that you use gamma you use gamma to compute the entropy of the children as a whole 
right so see but i use gamma too sorry i use gamma see, there is a left child so you have a left impurity yes you have a right child you have a right impurity now right. i am asking you what is the impurity of my children as a whole i need to yes. combine these two impurities right so i need to combine right. this impurity and i need to weigh them appropriately so for example had the split been like say uh, something else right so Mm. No, no, it's fine. It's clear, sir. Sixty got divided yeah. into twenty and forty. This clear. Yeah. So yeah, correct. So I need to give sixty percent of the importance to my right node, and forty percent of the importance to my left node. So I have to weigh or uh, weigh the impurity of the left node and right node appropriately, and then add them together. Yes. Okay. I have a question here. <clears throat> yeah. When we are calculating entropy at p, it is minus p log p. Minus of one minus p log one minus p, correct? Correct, correct. Yeah, that is correct. So with the proportion that is sixty forty, zero point six, I'll compute the entropy at p. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. When I come to l, l is having uh, maybe you should reverse the numbers over there because sixty pluses yes means sixty means it's only coming yeah. as well. the num. The number that you have written there is twenty plus and twenty minus over there. Uh, sorry, I didn't get this part. So sixty plus is what you said. Plus is a yes, isn't it? Yeah, sixty plus. plus yes. is, so yeah. on the left side, I should have sixty total. So forty, forty, forty. No, no. I should see on the left hand side. You should. You could have any number. All that you can say is that the number of positives should be less than or equal to sixty. Right? I can't say anything more. Or see. The total number of positives are conserved. So, twenty. If there are twenty positives here, there should be forty here. That's all I can say, right? I can't claim anything more. This is where I also got doubt. So, we have to split in such a way that positive go equal. Even if I don't know. If no, the no, proportion, no. if the proportion is how many are going to the left or the right. See, okay. Sure. Depends upon the question. No? Yeah, it depends upon the question. Okay, let me change it. If that is the cause for confusion, let me change this to. Okay, fair. Okay, fine. Okay. Even okay. if we actually put it that way, when I'm computing the entropy at L, let's take it as 2020 or what, whatever be the number that is. Okay. Yeah, okay. 50. Okay, 2020, 2020, 40, 20. Here also hmm. the entropy is going to be calculated as minus p log p plus, uh, sorry, minus minus one minus p log one minus p. Correct. 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 Now it is only when it coming to the information gain that this entropy gets multiplied by the proportion. Yes. Correct. Uh, right. Ravi. Yes. Ravi. Okay. Ravi. That P. Uh, Possible. Just give me a couple more minutes. Couple yeah. more no, minutes. No. Couple more minutes. Now, at L, should it be twenty twenty just because there is twenty here and forty over there, or can it be if the total number which are lessing at L are forty, can there be a thirty ten division also? So it depends. So, uh, so uh, let me change this. So are you asking? Can, can, I, can something? Yeah, like I this think the focus yes. yes, will be better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah so set. this can happen, right? So because yeah. uh, I can, my if my question were right. like this, then yeah. it would end up. That is all it was. Nothing else. Okay. Okay. Yeah. See that the reason I chose this was, uh, it's an arbitrary choice, right? I I don't know what this. First of all, I don't know what the data set is, right? So I'm just giving you an example of. If the split were to be like this, what will be the gamma? What will be the P P P R P R? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, on the R, if L is thirty ten, R will be fixed, or R can be a different combination of forty twenty also. No, no, no. L and R have to add up to P. Yeah, the conservation, right? Positives, negatives, total data points are conserved. So you. You you either you have a bag of sixty red, sixty green, forty red, right? Now the sixty green have to be split into these two bags, right? Depending on your question, thirty went here, and uh, a ten went here, right? Ten red uh, went here, and when I say sixty green, they can go only to the one side, right? No, they can't no, not go to both the sides. No, no. See, for example, let's take this concrete example. Now. When I say that x one is less than three point five, three greens go into L. One green have ends up in R. Yes. Right. So then, it's not that. Okay, I will be happy if all the greens go to one side. That's what I'm hoping for. But that need not happen. It depends on the question. Mm -hmm. Right. If my question were to be x one less than two point five, then 
two greens will only be there on the left and two greens will be there on the right yeah that is the impurity that is there on the right side correct that is uh, the impurity. two green being on this side uh, two green being on the right side will be the impurity on the right side yes contributing uh, to the impurity well yeah so not just the two greens but two by two plus uh, one two three four right two by six that will be the proportion of greens and from there you will go to the impurity yeah yeah I mean, not directly, but they'll be contributing to the impurity. Yeah, they'll be contributing. To, to, to the numbers. Correct, correct, yeah. So, once I am at L, what is the positives and the negatives that I am looking at? Like, L is having two greens now. Correct. So, there are no reds. So, yeah. L will be 1, 1. That's all. So, L will just have two greens, two positives. And it will have no zero reds. And R will have two greens and four reds, right? So it's just a partition. That's what a partition is, right? Partition is you divide it in such a way that if you put them together, you get back the whole. So right? maybe we'll take this at the end, right? So in the interest okay. of time, okay. I'll just move yeah. on because uh, we have week eight, which is probably a tougher. I just have one week. question here. Yeah. So in the meantime, please restore the values. Otherwise, you will be confused later on. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll restore the values. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as the values are where they are, just if you could go up uh, here, uh, what will we say that uh, what should we label L as positive or positive? Right? Positive, because right? Because uh, th uh, the thirty is more, right? The P is more. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what about R then? Because this is fifty-fifty. Uh, then you have to break ties. Typically, you can. Expect such questions to not come, but in practice, maybe you can take you, you can break ties arbitrarily and say that's say since L is positive, then R must be negative. Ah, uh, you can't say that also, right? So you can say either plus one or minus one. It you'll anyway have to split this node further because it's highly impure, right? It has maximum impurity, it has impurity of one. So okay, so we we'll cannot leave it as a leaf node, we'll have to make it an internal node further. Uh, right. Uh, you could leave it as a leaf node potentially and say and assign it a label of one or minus one, but in the actual decision tree algorithm will not do that. It will continue splitting it until the leaves are pure uh, and until you get pure leaves. And is there a uh, limit as to how much pure or impure it should be? What is the impurity usually acceptable? So the tree is grown until the leaves are completely pure. Oh, so P becomes uh, in, the entropy in, becomes in, almost zero. Yeah, in practice, about ten percent is okay. Okay. Thank yeah, you. in practice, yeah, you uh, about ten percent. Basically, what it means is, if I follow the tree and come to a leaf, and I predict that this is, let's say, you know, a person with whatever medium salary, and I say the the chance there is ten percent impurity, that means. The probability that ten percent of the time that person is doesn't belong to that group. Basically, people live with the tolerance that tolerance of much IP misclassification tenders. is acceptable. Yeah, basically misclassification only. See, this algorithm is nothing. At each stage, we are seeing what is the best way to which question to use to classify best, right? Segregate so, them into completely different yeah. classes. Yeah, I correct. Think, correct. Sir, I, I think sir, sir is going to compute the values now. Things will be more clarified. Yes. Yes. Please. Yes, please go ahead. What you want me to compute this now? Okay, no, no problem. No, no, no. Kartik said there's like eight, week eight is a killer. We'll... Yes, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So let us proceed, yeah. sir. Yes. Yeah, this I'll I'll upload this right anyway. So you can take a you can read from that, right? So see the final point, just a few more points. So yeah, so you have the decision boundaries in in a in a decision tree produced by decision tree are typically you know rectangles uh, in R2, so rectangles because Something like this, right? So this is a rectangle. Now they are cuboids in R3, basically boxes. And for higher dimensional spaces, they are hyper rectangles. Now, by default, the tree is grown until the leaves become pure, as I said. Now there are other ways to stop growing a tree, right? So you could either look at the depth of a tree, like don't grow a tree until it's like too long, right? So you make sure that you stop it before that, or you could look at how many samples are there in a leaf? For example, here, if if I have a 
three like this and that i have only one node in a in a particular sorry one data point in a particular node then i might not really want to have such a tree because with just one node i can't be very confident of my uh, sorry with just one example in a node i can't be very confident of my prediction right so i may specify that if if there is to be a leaf in a tree at least it should have five five no five data points right so things like this uh, uh, there are other ways of stopping now yeah so these points i leave it to you to read it from uh, the notes when i upload them now uh, i think we have to stop hard stop for yes yes yes, yes 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 and nitin nitin please carry on slides visible yeah okay thanks so you already you have already seen to uh, algorithm for classification and is knn and this is three now we are going to third one which is knife base algorithm and it will be clear why we are calling it knife base in this uh, this coming slides so let's get started so this is a generative model right so generative means like okay, here we are trying to find out uh, the actual distribution which the distribution which generates the data set right so we have interested in finding the distribution of p x y so we uh, we will find the, this distribution once we have found this distribution we will make use of this distribution to get the uh, to make the conclusion or to make the predictions for any unseen data set right so the setup is similar we have n data points and here we are assuming a binary classification problem so throughout this lecture we are assuming the classic binary classification problem only it means we have labels only 0 and 1 and one more assumption or one of one more thing we are assuming here is that all the features are taking only values 0 and 1 and so here every data points are coming in d dimensional space but every features are taking values only 0 and 1 right so any data points let's say i have data points is looking like one uh, zero, so, so it's taking values only zero and one, and, but but in the dimensional space. So that's that's the setup. And throughout this uh, this weekend, we are assuming this uh, for uh, bundle in IPS, we are assuming this, but Gaussian we will extend this notion further as well, right? Now, so what is generative? Generative means that we have to compute, we have to come up with the distribution of X and Y, right? So this distribution we need to come come up with. And uh, as you know that this probability can be written down as the marginal times the conditional conditional probabilities, right? So this p x comma y can be written as p y times p x given by. Now if we if we have estimated these probabilities, then we have actually uh, estimated my distribution p x comma y. So uh, uh, we will find out the probabilities of y and probability of x given by. So we will find out the distribution of y. I mean the distribution of labels and distribution of the conditional space, this is space, x given by. So we have only two values of y, y equal to 0 and 1. So we are interested into finding the distribution of px given y equal to 0 and px given y equal to 1. So these two distributions we need to find and the distribution of label as well. Once, once we have found this distribution, we actually found it out the joint distribution of x and y. That's just our goal is in this knife base algorithm. And we'll see later that how we can make use of uh, this distribution to make the predictions. Okay, but now, for now just assume that our task is to find this distribution. Uh, and uh, in other words, we need to find the distribution of y and distribution of x given y. Okay, so first let's compute the distribution of uh, y. That is, we need to find the distribution that probabilities of uh, by taking values 0 and by taking values 1. So how we can find these values? It's, it's pretty easy, right? So we have the data set with, with us and we can apply MLE and MLE says that just take the count of zeros and divided by the total number of examples. That will be the probability of by taking 0 and the probability that by takes values 1 will be just take those examples which are coming from class 1 divided by the total number of examples. That will be the estimated probability for pi, p by equal to 1 and we are calling it as a p. We, throughout the lecture, we will denote this probability to be 1. Oh, sorry, probability to be p, right? So this pro particular pro probability. Uh, could you just write down the example you just said? Yeah, yeah, we'll come like, to the example. Just let me let me explain this and we'll come to this example. 
and that uh, whole idea will be clear right so here we are just uh, mentioning how we can uh, find out the probabilities and we are denoting it as p by equal to 1 so what will be the probability of p by equal to 0 it's just 1 minus p so i just need to estimate this probability and this is just the same as uh, the number of examples this comes from class 1 divided by the total number of examples right class 1 examples and the total number of examples some sort of Bernoulli distance. Yeah, it's, it's the, since y takes only two values, y takes only 0 and 1. So you can think as a Bernoulli distribution and you are estimating P here, right? We don't know what is the probability of, so you can apply MLE and MLE says that just the proportion of the number of class 1 examples upon total number of examples, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we need to, so we have estimated this probability. Now we have to find this distribution as well, right? So we have to find two distribution now, we, but one is px given by equal to zero and one is px given by equal to one, right? Now, so both will go in similar manner, just uh, focus on this now. How, uh, so finding distribution means what? We have uh, this distribution x given by equal to zero. It means we are finding the PMF of this uh, this particular distribution. So how many uh, values are there in the in this ra range of this, uh, this random variable? You can think as a random variable. So uh, finding distribution or finding PMS, PMF means that for all possible values of this uh, distribution or this random variable, we will assign a probability to all those uh, uh, those elements, right? So how many possible values this distribution can take? So how many x you can can design? Two power d. Why? Because uh, you know every feature can either be zero and one. So, yeah, so so any any data point is looking like this thing, right? So it's uh, we have d features, right? F one to F d, right? And and the all all these features, I mean these all F i s are coming from only zero and one. They are taking very zero and one, right? So how many such x i s you can des design uh, design? So you have uh, total. You uh, F i can take values two values. Similarly, F two again can take two values. Similarly, all d features can take two values, right? So in that manner, any you have total number of two raised over d data points uh, in the range of this random variable, right? So how many probability? So you have to assign probability to all those data points. So how many probabilities uh, you have to uh, estimate? Two raised to d minus one. Minus one because probability always adds up to one, right? So these many pair probabilities you have to estimate it. As you have to estimate for this particular distribution, right? Similarly, if you go for the distribution x given by equal to 1, uh, the similar argument follows there as well. So 2 raised to power d minus 1 uh, parameter, again, you have to estimate it for this distribution. And now we are done. We have to estimate it how many parameters? 1 for the p by equal to 1 and 2 raised to power d minus 1 for both, uh, for both the distribution in total. This is going to be 2 raised to power t plus 1 minus 1 parameter we have to estimate. And if you look at this number, this is exponential in exponential in the number of features. So you have to feed lots of parameter to your model to uh, to come up with the model, right? So so this is very high number and we generally don't go with this, this uh, approach for modeling, right? And, and now we will um, impose one conditions over there. And the condition says that and this condition actually is called as naive condition and that's where the name comes for the algorithm It's naive conditions and it says that given the label your features are independent it means that what what does that mean so your x is looking like some uh, uh, f1 to f2 right this this is your x so uh, if i'm finding the probability of px given by so i'm finding the probability that the your data point is uh, f1 up to f d given the y so so the conditional this naive condition says that given the label your feature given the label your features are independent so this probability you can write as the product of this thing right so f1 given by times p f2 given by so what is the what is the takeaway from here so so this this probability you can break down into this uh, multiplication of all these probabilities right now you need not to estimate all those parameters so for every x you have you have uh, in that approach you have to estimate two raised to the power d minus one parameter but here if you know that uh, what is that uh, this this values right so if you can estimate this values for every data points you can find out the probabilities you can actually can estimate those probabilities so how many parameter now you have to estimate 
Only D of them, right? D of them, D of, D of, D of them distribution you can find. So this uh, value, if you found that what is the probability that F1 takes varies one given by if if this parameter I this value I know for all such D features. I mean, so F2 equal to one given by all up to D features. I know this value I have estimated, and for any data point I can find the probability, right? Can you explain this part once again, please? Two power okay. d minus one and two power uh, uh, basically t. So up to this part, is it clear how this this two raised to the power d plus one minus one is coming up? Yes. So, okay. so one quick question: This two power d plus one minus one would be for uh, why why taking values uh, zero and one? But if it is multi-class, then this this could change. Like if there are three classifications. Then this will change, right? Yeah. yeah then two, are then classes, two, then the parameter will change. Yeah. Right? Then two, just two in two power d minus one into two, right? Just replace that two with whatever number K of classes, K number classes, of classes. K. That's it. Okay. Thank you. And this minus this one will be one plus k into two power d. Uh, Correct. K into two power d minus k plus one or whatever. In that case, you you have to find the distribution like p x given by equal to zero. X given by equal to one, and X given by equal to two, right? So all these distribution you need to find for every you need to raise to power d minus one uh, uh, estimations, right? So similarly for all this thing as well for this distribution as well. So in total you need to into two raise to power d minus one estimated for this distribution and one and two for that p by equal to one, p by equal to two, or p by equal to zero, right? Two estimation you need here. So two parameter you have to estimate here, and three to raise to power d minus one parameters you have to estimate here. So total you will have two plus three raised to power two d minus one. This thing. Yes. You have three classes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. So here, since we are assuming the naive condition, it means it means that given the label, your features are independent. It means for any data points, this probability can be written down this thing, right? And once we know this probability is for any data point, I can find the prob this probability. So, so uh, once I know I, I estimated these D probabilities, I for any data point I can find the probability. So in that case, I only need to know D parameter. To, I only need to estimate D parameters, right? And similarly for uh, x given by equal to zero, I need to D parameter. Similarly, x given by equal to one, I need D parameter. So two D parameters in total plus one for the Label distributions, right? Distributions of the labels. So, in total, now we need two two d plus one estimation. As uh, as you can see there, it was exponential in d. D now it's linear in d. So you have uh, your number of parameter to estimate has decreased down a lot, right? So here, this this number parameter are manageable. Now you can feed those in your model. So condition of the assumption of uh, independence is what is giving us this uh, flexibility. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Otherwise, you cannot write. You cannot uh, write this as in the product of all these things, right? These features. Okay. Sir, in this case, uh, the the probability of all the features doesn't add up to the one, ka, sir. So these are two different different probability space, right? So this f f one f one given by is, is one one of the probability space. F one given by f two given by its uh, another feature space. What you can say is that probability that f one given Uh, one given by plus probability of f one given zero uh, f one equal to zero given by this should add up to one right because this 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 has only two values uh, 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 either it will take zero one or or it will take zero okay 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 understood sir yeah you're right because see it won't add up because they're independent now now these are two different probability space or you can say different random variables. For f one given by f two given by, so they they need not to add up to one. Okay, so this this particular estimate and we estimation or estimate we are denoting as p. Uh, let's say I'm so estimating p as say given by equal to some some by. Okay, so this estimation I'm denoting as p f j and p by. Okay, so this notion you you need to remember. What does it mean? Is the estimate estimate for uh, 
probability that x is the jth feature. So the which feature we are talking about is the subscript of that, right? So we are talking about the jth feature which takes values one given that superscript. So by equal to one. Okay, so this this notion you need not to be confused. Otherwise that uh, uh, you may make cal calculation mistake and also this this we are following throughout the lecture. Okay. Now, so this this all is about the number of parameter. How many number of parameters you have to estimate, right? Okay. So throughout uh, now throughout the lecture, we are assuming the naive condition. It means that given the levels, we are assuming the features are independent to each other. Okay. Now come to the uh, initial problem where we started with. We want to find find out this estimate, right? Once we know this estimate, I can find the distribution of x and y. So now we know how many parameters are there, but actually we need to estimate those as well, right? So this estimate we now know how how we can estimate. Just it's just the proportions of the class one examples and the class zero examples, and that's it, right? Now what about this? How to estimate these parameters? Okay. One question: X is the features or uh, the data points? So here I'm denoting X as a data point. So F I F J I'm denoting as the features, I F features and X as a data point. Okay. So so these formulas will make sense more when we like do this this for one example. Okay, so for in this particular example, just think as this you have been given three features and all three features are taking values only one and zero, right? And these are binary classification problem because the labels are only one and zero. Now you have to you have to estimate the parameter. So what parameter you have to estimate in this case? One is P. Which is probability of by equal to one, right? So, what is this p? Half. Point. So, it's just the count of count of uh, or the proportion of class one example. So, one, two, three, four. Four by seven. Example belongs to class one. So, this is one by four. Four whatever. Four by seven. Four, four by seven. How many data points? Four by seven. Four by seven, right? Four by seven. Four by seven is. Ah, the sorry, four by. I thought four by eight. Correct, four by seven. Okay. Four by seven. Okay. We have seven data points. Now, what what other parameter you you need to estimate? You need to estimate the p uh, first uh, features taking value one given by equal to zero, right? So this this we are denoting as this estimate we are denoting as p one uh, zero. P one zero, right? Zero. So what what will be this? Now you only uh, you are in the space where y equal to zero. You are the in the in the conditional space. So all, you will look only for those examples which belongs to class zero. Just forget about all those which belongs to class one. Now just uh, take these examples. This one, this one, and this one. Now uh, how you will estimate the probability that f one equal to one? So you will look at one, the one by three. One by three. So you here in this out of these three examples. Only one example is there. Four means the first feature value is one, right? Mm. So it's just one by three. Okay. Similarly, what will be the estimate for p one one? Uh, one by three by four. By four, yeah. So now you are looking at the examples. So it's the estimate that the first feature is taking value one, given that label is one, right? So you are looking in the uh, these examples, these four examples. This one, this one. Uh, this one and this one, and looking at the first feature value. So only this thing, this thing, this thing. So three by four is the estimate for this thing. Similarly, you can find out the estimate for p two zero, p two one, and p p zero, p about three one, right? That's all parameter I need to estimate. And this this is what this formula says. So, sir, we have to uh, calculate for all the features, right? One by one. One, one by one, all the four. Once it takes the, the value zero, once it takes the value one. Yeah. Not the values. It's coming from level zero, or level one. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. So, superscript is level, right? Yeah, superscript super level. Yeah. Okay. So this what this uh, formula says. So P hat is the probability. This is. Estimate for p by equal to one, so it just add all those labels. So zeros is will count the number of ones and this total number of examples, right? Similarly, for this estimate that uh, uh, probability that j features taking value one given the label is y, so it just we will looking only for those examples which for which the label is one, right? So we are looking at only those examples here. Now out of those examples, the, we are looking only for those which 
for which the tier feature is well. So that's what this compass says, right? And we take that proportion out of this. So similarly, we can count for any uh, features, right? Now we have the estimate. So that was our initial target. We have to estimate those parameters. Once we have those parameters, we have my distribution px x uh, p x of y. Now, how I can make use of this to make the prediction? That's where the base theorem comes in, right? So what what I need to do? I need to I need to find the for any data point x. If I need to make the pred uh, as, uh, prediction, what what I will do? I will find this probability p by equal to zero. What is the probability that the data point belongs to class zero? And what is the probability that class it belongs to class one, right? Once I know this probability, I will assign the class which which uh, which has the highest probability. If this is the this is greater than this one, then I will assign the data point to class zero, or otherwise I will assign it to class one, right? So how I how I can find this probability? Now I have the distribution p x comma y, right? Sir, if both the probabilities are equal, I say equal. Equal if it comes equal, then you can break the tie randomly or say the positive class. You can toss correctly. Yes. Okay. So how you can find this probability using this distribution? So the base base theorem you have to apply, right? So what base theorem says? P by equal to zero given x. What will be this? Uh, P of x by equal to zero. To condition done by equal to zero. Equal to zero. And into p of y equal to five equal to zero. Okay, and divide by p of x. P of x, okay. right? Okay, and what will be p p by equal to one given x? Given x. Same thing, same. Similar. Thing, sir. Similar. No, Similar thing, but no. the this will become p, p of x given y equal to one. One. Y equal to one. Then uh, p of y equal to one. P of y equal to divided by P of x. P y equal to and P P x, right? Yeah. Okay. So as I'm comparing these values, which one is larger? I can avoid the denominator because it's the same in both, right? So I need to compute these two values now. So I have this value or not? Yes. Yes. I have, I have estimated, or or this I also estimated, right? So do I have these values or not? Yes. I have estimated, right? Because yeah. I'm saying this x as x can x can be any data point, and I can write down as a pro as a the product of those individual things, and then I can just uh, use make use of those estimate. Now that's how I can make the predictions, right? For any data point. So that's why this is called base base theorem because we are making use of the base or by uh, naive if conditions coming up through that condition and the uh, base is coming from this by because they are making use of base theorem in making predictions right so similarly for this lag like, so what example we made here the it one if, if i need to make it or say let's say i am to make the prediction for this example so how i may i will make the prediction for this example the point is 010 zero, zero, right so i need to make the prediction for that so what i will do i will find let's say it's x right so i i, I will find p x given by equal to uh, or or what i need to find i need to find p by equal to 0 given x and p by equal to 1 given x i will choose which one is the larger right and for for finding these things what i can write so this can i can write as p x given by equal to 0 times p by equal to 0 and i'm avoiding the denominator for now so this thing can I write? I can write as p. Uh, the first feature is taking value zero because the data point is one zero one zero. So first taking first feature is taking value given by equal to zero uh, times. Now this is the naive condition, right? That's what I'm applying here. So, so second feature is taking value one given by equal to zero times probability that uh, uh, the third feature is taking value zero given by equal to zero. And the, this is probability as so this is the minus p, right? And this estimated, I uh, this all I have already estimated. This is how I am denoting this. This is this is your p as p one p one zero p one zero, right? And this is what this is your p two p two one zero p two zero zero yeah subscript p three zero. P3, zero. And this is your yeah. all these values I have estimated. Similarly, for I can find p uh, <coughs> x given by equal to one as well, and uh, p 
by equal to one. So I just compare those values. Which one is larger? I just send those example to that table. One question I have. Can you go back to the table, please? This is only an example, right? Because the first two points, the features are like one, one, one. The y yeah, is it's one. just a training example. So training. two data, two same data points are coming. One is coming from class one and class two. Okay, so it's not like only one example in India. Probably more, many more examples are left in this uh, training data set. Okay. So any question till this point? Okay, so there's a pitfall in the nine ways and uh, what does it say? So uh, these probabilities, I, whatever uh, I mentioned here, I just written down the mathematical form. So you can read as because uh, I'm just taking multiplication of those probabilities. If the feature, if feature is one, then I will uh, multiply with pi. And if the if feature is zero, then it's one minus pi. So similar, so the power will make sure that is adding, we are multiplying this uh, correct one, right? So if it's, is the if feature is zero, then I'm actually multiplying this thing, and if the if feature is one, then I'm multiplying this thing. So this I just wrote in the mathematical form. And uh, what is the pitfall says? So what if the all the j uh, j feature values is one in all the training example? Then what will be this probability? So what is this probability says? This is the estimate for uh, the j features taking value zero, level is zero. One is always one. That's what I'm saying. That uh, remember what this notation says. J subscript J means that you are talking about the J features taking value one, even by equal to zero, right? So what is this probability? One. If the J features value is always one for all the examples. Probability is one. Is one, right? And what is this probability? Is also one. So this this is that the J F features taking value uh, one given that by equal to one right so it's again one right yeah it's one again now now any data points comes like where the J F feature value is zero let's say your the J F feature here I'm take uh, so let's say uh, uh, let's see if I can find an example in this particular sorry just a quick question should is that one or the second one is zero second one is one right both are one. One is y is equal to zero. Oh, okay, sorry. Hmm. Right. So, okay. so, so let's say my second feature values in in training examples takes all values one, right? Second feature, I mean, this F two takes all values one. Now, in the my test data points, let's say x one uh, x test, uh, it's coming like uh, one zero or some. Let's my two times the data points is there, right? So, what what about this? Uh, if I estimate the probability, I will make the prediction for this. I need uh, that the second feature taking value is zero, right? This probability I need for by equal whatever this is, or right? and this probability is zero now, correct? Right? So, and for both by equal to one as well, and for by equal to three as well, or even if it's, it's, it's only zero for any of these things, this uh, this algorithm will fail because this probability now will go to zero. And why this is happening? Because the you have come across. With one example which is not lying in the training example, so my base feels when any test data points comes from out of the uh, uh, out of the training examples, right? So how how to overcome this problem? Sir, can you elaborate again this example? The it is Laplace moving. Yeah, so someone was asking for. Sir, yeah, this sir uh, both are equal to one. Given so what are equal to then for, for any data points where the second feature value is zero, right? So what I'm saying that in the training example, the second feature value is one for all the training examples, training in the training data set, right? No, sir, so now, no, sir, uh, sir, my question is this, sir. So probability of f j equal to one, okay, y equals to zero, okay. Mm -hmm. Given f j equal to one and y equal to one, given f j equal to one, is both are equal one, sir. I didn't get this. Okay, so how you will estimate this probability? Uh, this, I think he was asking the same thing that I was also gotten stuck at. If if j of zero given y is equal to zero is there, that is when you get one minus p. So that will be zero, Rohit. Uh, so correct, yeah, correct. So j of z, if j is equal to zero, y is mm -hmm. equal to zero, that will be zero. This will not the other one, the one below will not be zero. 
that is where I was also a little caught. So is that doubt clear? Yes, sir. yes. Okay, so because that this probability is zero now, this particular probability will go to zero and uh, you will fail to make the any prediction in that case, right? So, and similarly for if the any features taking only one kind of value, then again, this this algorithm will fail to make the predictions and you can verify it as or, well. Yeah. Algorithm will fail or we will classify all of them in one group, actually. Yeah, or you can say in that case. So the possible fix for that is called Laplace smoothing. So what we are doing, we are adding four examples. So uh, one example we solved all the features values that one, which is coming from class zero, and one example which is uh, taking all the values zero, which is coming from class zero. Similarly for class one, we add two examples as well, right? And this makes sure that your uh, uh, all the features are present in that. So everyone will take values one as well or zero as well, at least one, right? In the training example to class zero and class one as well. So, so, but technically, I can just add the last two also and get away with it, right? If I add the last two values, then no, no, the, the last two rows, mm -hmm. even if I just add these two data points, also I'm fine, right? Actually, tech, for your for this situation, for this particular example, yeah. For this particular example, we are talking yeah, about yeah, yeah. Here, again, here again, we have these two examples as well. So here, actually, you need not to do any smooth thing. But in general, no, no, I'm uh, saying, I'm saying if you just come down, so not this example, sir, the other example you gave, right, where let's say, huh, this one, right? In this case, basically, you don't have a zero. Yeah, if, if I, right? if I'm coming up with the example, then uh, the only adding zero will do the work for me. But uh, in practice, what we do, we add those four examples to make sure okay. that any features doesn't, uh, okay. not basically we are, correct, we are correcting for all possibilities in one go all possibilities, possibilities. got it got it got it now i got it because prof had mentioned only two he said this this is this two we will add but essentially by adding four like if there is a problem with any other feature also that also will get corrected that, yes, yes okay fine okay so So I think we are done with the most of the part. The next is decision boundary, how the decision boundary will look like in the case of knife base. So this is this particular is actually called Bernoulli knife base. Bernoulli by because every feature are taking only two values, one and zero. So distributions of every features you can think as a binomial. So at that Bernoulli distribution. So that's why this particular uh, algorithm is called Bernoulli knife base, right? And the, how the decision boundary will look like in this case. So decision boundary are all all those points where this uh, this uh, this ties, right? This probability is ties. And if you solve this, uh, this probability is in, in, in the variables FIs, then you will get a linear relationship in FI, and you can uh, say that the uh, decision boundary in knife base is linear, uh, or say decision boundary in uh, Bernoulli knife base. Okay. It's linear. So now let's go to the next part. Okay, so this I have already written down here. Okay, so let's go to the Gaussian knife base. Okay, so we are here we are making assumption that all the features are taking values 1 and 0, and even this can be extended to the marginal knife base as well, where features are not only taking two values, more than two values are possible for features, and that will lead to multinobile knife base. So you can read up later. For now, you can just assume only these two. Bernoulli and Gaussian. So Gaussian, now we are saying that features can all take any real values. And we are assuming that the features follow the Gaussian distributions. And the same naive conditions, again, we are imposing here. OK, so uh, the features taking values. So I'm taking the, uh, this distribution that uh, by, by given 0 follows the normal distribution with mu, uh, with the mean mu and the variance sigma 0. and <coughs> Again, for the class one distribution, the follows normal distribution with mu one, with mean one and sigma uh, variance one. Okay, so uh, here, here, one point to note is that these should be diagonal mat diagonal matrices. And can any anyone uh, claim that by this should be diagonal always? Okay, so 
So that's what uh, if you, you responded to my question on Discord. See, Dijkdal, because we are assuming they are independent of each other. Yeah, that so, naive conditions we are imposing, yeah. right? That's but, because they must yeah. be diagonal matrix. Correct. See, the data you gave for that problem, and I went ahead and it's not asked yeah. in the practice assignment, but I, for just to understand, I calculated the covariance matrix. Yeah. So you are in, there, implementing in naive in in any any training data set, then your covariance matrices should be diagonal matrices. Correct. Correct. I'm saying in that case, I don't know because the data is made up data. While mm -hmm. the di off diagonals are not zero, mm -hmm. they're very, very small. Yeah. Right? They're very, very small. So you can assume that they're independent features yeah. almost. So this right? knife condition need not to be true always. In in practice, this knife condition need not to be true, but this particular algorithm seems to work well where in some of the uh, problems like text classification and all. So yeah, no, there is a there is a paper actually. I, I'll share it with you later. Mm -hmm. uh, in practice, although the naive assumption doesn't hold, somehow this algorithm works very well. Very well, yes. Yeah. Uh, so there's actually a lot of research on why it works well. Yeah, so uh, I cannot commit to, to uh, but uh, to my ex my experience says that naive base works well in the case of where the data set is is sparse, like text text data set, right? So there that uh, your features may be large features. So in that case, your naive base uh, seems to work better, uh, work better than other other classification algorithm. Maybe I don't know. Good point. So here now assume that if the variance are similar, then how many parameter you need to estimate this mu zero, mu one, and sigma, and one for the uh, distribu distributions of paper size. So four parameters here. Right, and if if they are uh, different sigmas, then you have five five estimator, right? Sigma one and sigma zero as well. So these are the number of parameters, and the same rule we I, we will apply. So uh, okay, so this I can, and the same base rule you can apply to make the predictions, and I think you can take examples to make these calculations. So, yeah. Sir, one one question I had, which mm -hmm. you answered partly. See, mm -hmm. when do we decide? that I should take separate covariance matrices or uh, the covariance matrix should be the same across both classes. Okay, how so do in, I decide? So in general, we never know that how they they are distributed along different classes, right? So so we make a, we, we started with the assumption that they they uh, their, assume, their variance are similar and we can go with the same same, uh, same covariance for both the classes. But if they, they have not give some uh, better accuracy, then you can go probably may go for the uh, different okay. covariance. Okay. Okay. Right? okay, got it, got it, got it. Okay, let's, uh, for, uh, for completion, okay. I just take one example and uh, all these things will be clear. Let's say you have two features, F1 and F2, and the label Y, and your uh, 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 example, let's say three values, you have X1, X2, and X3, uh, and the values are 1.2, 0.4, Minus 1.8. Some random values are picking up, and two four two point two. Uh, you can you can take that if you want. You can take the practice assignment question, sir. If you want, if you want some data. It's there. I think that that's uh, kind of similar. Is uh, uh, that again a high hand coded data set? It's not like very good data set. Right? So so same. I think practice assignment I've already done in my, in my previous session. So this ah, okay. and this this is what this is. Let's say let's say four points for both the classes and uh, 1.6 and minus 2.4 okay some point and this belongs to class one class zero class and class zero now you have to estimate it p p will be seen one zero point five is easy now what what is uh, what is mu naught mu naught you just take the mean of class zero points so these are the points so you will take the mean of these points these two points right so what will the mean so it's just 0 0.4 plus 0 0.8 by 2 so this will be your 0 0.6 and uh, 0 0.8 minus 2.4 by 2. So is is the mean point of these two points? So 0 0.4, 0 0.8, and 0 0.8 minus 2.4. So mean of these two points. What will be the mean of these two points? Just the take the mean element wise. So this will be minus, your 0 .8. minus 0 0.8. 0 0.6 and minus 0 0.8. Minus 0 0.8. Yeah, what okay. is 0.4? Okay, zero point eight. Okay, okay, zero minus zero point eight, whatever that is. Yeah. Right. So this is the mu zero. What is mu one? Mu 
one will be minus point three. Minus these two points. Minus uh, these two points. So this will be one minus point three and two. Minus point three and two. Zero point three and this will be your two. Two right. Two point zero. So this is your mu one. What if, what about sigma? I'm assuming sigma to be same. Then I just take uh, uh, x all x i's and by different uh, different by its mean and uh, take the transpose of that and just x i minus and sum over all those data points. So what I will do? I just center them my data points. So no no sir, the other way around. X minus mu into x minus mu transpose. Provenance, right? Yeah, provenance is x, x, x. Okay. So for for this data points, I will subtract the this mu zero, a uh, mu one, because this belongs to class one. And similarly for x two, I will subtract the mu zero. And for x three, I will subtract the uh, I will subtract the mu one, because it belongs to class one. And for x four, I will subtract the class uh, mu zero, which belongs to class zero, and will will take the transpose of this and then sum over all the data points. Okay. That's how I can be, uh, can calculate for, variance. For uh, x one, we will subtract uh, mu one and one. x two mu zero and so yes. on. So. Yes. Yes. Okay. And if I'm if I'm taking sigma one sigma two be different, then what I will do separately? I will do the same calculation for these two different classes. So I will I will now I will make use of only these two points for calculating sigma zero and for sigma one I will make use of only these two points sigma uh, class one points. Okay. So this this is how you make sigma zero and sigma. Quick question: X is a column matrix or a row matrix? X is a column matrix. So we'll be points. ending up with a two by two matrix, is it? Where? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. correct. Two by two. Okay. Okay. So this sigma you are talking about. Yeah, this will be two by two matrix. Okay. So, this, so, uh, sorry. so here you can think as the variance along the first feature, variance along the second feature, and all other entries you can think as zeros. So finally, constructing covariance matrix then. Huh? Okay. okay. Sir, mu one, sir, how it come? Uh, my negative uh, point three, and mu one. So mu one, you will taking the mean of one. This Minus one point eight is there, no? That's right. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, Minus so one you... point. The point six by two, so now that's why minus point three, minus point six by two. So, so decision, how the decision boundary? Sir, may I please uh, just yeah, yes, uh, yes. take a minute? Uh, you said uh, if e naught and e one are uh, different, then we'll calculate them separately for uh, each class level. Class one yeah? example and class zero example. But then, how do I know I'm supposed to calculate e or uh, these separately? What is e? Sigma, sigma. Sorry, sigma. Not e. I'm so, so that was that sigma, was my that was entry. my question. You can also follow on this course. He's written back. That was my question. He's saying in practice, assume they're the same. Calculate overall. If your accuracy is not that good in terms of classification, then you break. You separately calculate and try. So there's no hard I and fast rule. Okay, that's from a real uh, practice point of view. But what do I do for an exam point of view? Exam, they will say, na? They will tell you whether should you calculate separately or together. Yeah, there, there it will be mentioned whether you have to assume same or different. Okay. Sir, will there be questions from week eight also? Of course, there will be. Of, of course, okay. expect a lot of them. <laughs> will we be expected to compute the probabilities and everything, or uh, it will no, be given so like? No, so there there will be any calculation that will be easy easy to do, not like very lengthy calculations. We we won't expect you to do calculations calculations there. Okay, just to quantify, it will be like graded assignment. So so how do you find the calculation in this one? It's not like lengthy calculations, right? So similar kind of thing you can expect in this one. Or a, or you can think as a mock mock mock, not. Okay. Sir, 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 can you once again tell this example roughly? This this uh, second example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here I'm last. So here I need to estimate these parameters. Let me do this. Okay. So so I need to pay, estimate mu zero, right? Mu zero. What okay. will be mu zero? Mu zero will be the mean of all class zero points, right? Okay, so okay. I have two class zero points. One zero point four and uh, this zero point four, zero point eight, and one is uh, uh, zero point eight and eight and negative two point four. So I have to take mean of these points. What will be the mean of these points? Uh, 
this is 0.6 and this is my negative 0.8 so this is your mu 0 and similarly mu 1 will be your 1.2 2.4 so whatever the point belongs to class 1 take the mean of that that will be your mean, mean one, right? okay mean okay one, right? and similarly okay. for sigma 0 what you will do you will center those data points so center for centering data points you will make sure that you subtract the corresponding mean so if you are since if x1 belongs to class 1 you will subtract mu 1 from from this Okay, you will subtract mu zero from this. You will subtract mu one from it, and you will subtract mu zero from it. Okay. Now just take x x transpose, and and uh, do for all all those things, all those data. So when we are subtracting uh, mu zero and mu one, we are subtracting it only from the points relevant to Element zero or. That is. Sorry. Elements. So your your point Are we is centering the data by any. Is so the, centering does, the classes classes data set. So class zero so data set, class one data set. Class one data set. We are centering. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically, here for point x one, we will take one point two minus uh, of uh, minus minus of zero point three. So let's say for this zero point four zero point eight. So what you will do, you will subtract this mean. Right, so this will be your minus 0 0.2, and uh, this will be your uh, 1.6. Right, so this will your this will be your uh, that mean centered point. Similarly, for this, you will do you will subtract this will be become 0 0.2, and this will become your minus 1.6. Right. Okay, there are two data sets, isn't it? For zero and two each for zero and one of y. Yeah. So we subtract it for both of them, and then add them up, or how is this? So so you have done centering for these two data points, right? This is coming up to be this one and this one. Similarly, you will do for the remaining data points. You have one point source. Uh, mu one will be what? Your mu one will be. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, what I mean to ask is, when you are computing the covariance matrix, mm -hmm. you have x i minus mu zero. Or what? What? What exactly is yeah. that? Correct. Why is it? Good? That's a actually a good question, Ravi. So is if x i belongs to zero class, then take mu zero. If x i belongs to class one. Take mu one. So for each data point, we will get a matrix. X X transpose. X X transpose the limit. And then we will sum up the element. All the elements. And by one by four. Okay, right. Okay, yeah, I forget that this, this will be yeah. X X transpose for for each each data point and sum up them and then average them out. Yes. It's just like covariance, like covariance matrix XX transpose, where these X are centered, mean centered. The only difference is in that we have this one mean where they have separate. Yeah, separate mean for different classes. Yes, Divya, can you repeat that? Sorry, uh, your voice is very, very feeble for me. Saying is in uh, when we are centering uh, for finding covariance matrix. Divya, for example, Divya, in Divya, Divya can't hear you. Microphone probably is away from you. Uh, is that better now? Uh, yeah, lot better. Yeah, what I'm saying, like in PCA, we were uh, sent uh, means uh, centering the data, so we mm -hmm. just used a single mean vector to do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Here we are centering each of these data points with their respective means, means depending okay. on what their y label is. So if X okay. size label Y label is uh, zero, we will use uh, U U naught, and if it is uh, one, we will use U one. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Yeah. The final will be matrix, right? Answer will be. The final will be a matrix, uh, D by D matrix. And generally, say it's a, just a diagonal matrix because we are imposing the knife condition. So, so you just take the variance along the, every features and uh, put out put along the diagonal. That's it, principal diagonal. That's what you do here. But in general, this sigma, if you calculate for any data set, any training data set, you will find that this sigma is not, not coming out to be a diagonal matrix. Then you just multiply it by the identity matrix of D by D. Then yeah, but but su suppose in an exam it comes, mm -hmm. just for the sake of argument, uh, we report as is, right? We don't have to multiply with i because 
that is an us that is we are forcing it to be off diagonals is zero but the truth yeah. is that there could be some variance yeah, right yeah there can be some covariance co covariance co co right or correlation right uh, either way but, uh, okay okay one more question okay i find the covariance for all i mean like okay for each point and then add them up average them mm -hmm. is there some conclusion that i can draw with this covariance matrix this covariance matrix so here the, here al along the diagonal you have the variance along the features like correct so, so you have let's say four three features f1 f2 f3 f1 f2 f3 Right. So diagonal will be the features uh, for variances. So variance along first feature, variance along second feature, variance along third feature. So here, here you will be the co covariance along F1 and F2. So covariance for first feature and the third feature, which this entry will be here. Uh, so this this entry will be here, right? And uh, covariance of F2 and F1 will be here. So similarly, you can think like this. The, the one conclusion is or one observation will be if the off diagonal values are very small it means the the naive base assumption holds well which means that you know, which is the independent is that sir oh yeah, yeah. they're independent and correlated so what is this sentences that are written over here decision function linear if covariance matrix matrices are the same quadratic if covariance matrices are different yeah. I think so, sigma not and sigma one, I think. This is for the, if you remember uh, while doing uh, the uh, K and N, no, not K and N, uh, the so decision tree. Is, we had the, sorry, sir. Yeah, so this is like if sigma is same, I mean sigma zero is sigma one, then the decision boundary in Gaussian naive will be a linear, linear boundary. So it means that if the uh, sigma is similar, then you can think like both uh, mu one, mu zero here, mu one here, and your uh, distribution is like something like this, right? So similar, similar variance, right? So so this in boundary in this case will be a linear one. But if the covariance are different, like let's say sigma zero and sigma one is not equal, uh, then in this case your your distribution let's say mu zero here and mu mu two is somewhere here we went somewhere and uh, here variance is something something this and here variance is something different right some this thing so in this case your decision boundary will be some quadratic form and, and such you will form it uh, decision boundary so not this is we may probably this one so so this will be your uh, quadratic if the covariances are different okay when we say uh, sigma zero is equal to sigma one then sigma four Zeros is computed separately and ones is computed separately. No, is it is actually one which is which is sigma that you get it for considering all the data points. Whatever. So same for all data points. Uh, sir, just a slight interruption. Uh, from the quiz point of view, is that formula for prediction that was derived in the video lectures by the prof? Is that important or can we skip that? Formula for the prediction that is base based theorem, right? Uh, in case of uh, this Gaussian naive base, it was very lengthy using log p hat, p hat, okay, so you are asking for decision boundary, right? Yeah, the decision function that the prediction function was there, no? Mm -hmm. I got the point. So, so uh, uh, the, the, can I if I can just load on to that question? Yeah, see, so far in this, uh, we have seen how to estimate the parameters, right. Yeah. Uh, we've not you've not given us a new point and told us to now tell me whether it belongs to zero or one right when if you have to do that it may not come in the quiz but if we have to do that then we have to know how to use the covariance matrix and all that in in a gaussian format right to get to a value okay this that, gaussian that, matrix you're talking about. yeah that that becomes that is complicated we've never done that we've never actually no, not complicated because the pdf is like kind of Okay, uh, not that uh, that e raised to power something. So so like let's say you have assumed p, you have estimated p to be let's say some value zero point five and mu zero to some point. So I'm taking one dimensional data points. Okay, so let's so say one one dimensional is very easy, sir. It's two dimensional which is a problem. So in that two dimensional, how the uh, multivariate that, uh, that PDF will look like normal? Uh, e will power be some e power two pi uh, yeah something right. 
and, and it is the power. It is the power. So or let's say exponential that it will be x i minus mu i, and uh, uh, this will be your sigma trans sigma, and uh, then x i mm -hmm. minus mu i transpose by two. So so this 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 all calculation you have to do to find the P D F. Yeah, sigma inverse. Uh, yes, sigma inverse. Yeah. Right. I'm saying we've never actually. I've never physically done this with hand. Univariate is very simple. Uh, so so idea is simple, but in the higher dimension, this uh, this PDF calculation will become a little lengthy. So hand, by hand by doing this manually is not easy task, right? So that's why we skip doing calculation here. But but the idea is similar. You just apply the same, right? So you just correct, apply correct. the base theorem. Correct. I think that's what uh, Divya or somebody was asking. Will this formula remembering this is important or not for quiz? PDF formula. This one yeah, yeah. you are asking for, or yes, 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 yes. This you multivariate PDF. So I am asking about this formula e to the power minus x s minus mu one hat transpose that one. We have already remembered it. Right? It was for a uh, prediction in case of Gaussian naive bays. From the video lectures and all. No, no, you no need to remember that formula. Just, just go by step by uh, step. So, so remember, you have estimated mu zero. Let's say four point five beta point two estimated to be uh, to be zero and mu one to be three, and the sigma sigma square to be let's say uh, let's say what four for both. I'm assuming to be same, right? Now, now you have to assume you have to make predictions for let's say five beta point. It's coming to be let's say two. Or say one point two say right. Now you have to make the prediction for that. So what you will do? What uh, you have to find the probability that is belongs to class zero, given the data point, right? And you have to find the probability the same procedure that we have done, right? And uh, class data point. So what what you will find? You will find uh, uh, p uh, p uh, data point is two, x is two, given by equal to zero times p by equal to zero, right? And, yes. and I I uh, am avoiding the denominator term because it's gonna be same here. again. So here is again we will find p by equal to x equal to two given by equal to one times p by equal to one, right? And this this we know this is zero point five. And so what is this? Now this follows what this x x given e by power e power minus this is normal distribution. This is normal distribution with mean with zero, zero and sigma and square two, right? So you can find this PDF value, right? Yes. So calling it probability is not a good way, but you can call it as a PMF or PDF of that. So density function of that. Right? Okay, sir. Yeah, so we have to actually go with the formula that we have learned from stats two and not the complicated decision function that's very lengthy. Yeah. Okay, so give sure. me one minute. I just have to stop for a minute and we'll come back. Hello. Yeah, I think Prof would come back. Okay, okay. I think what happened. No, we have to discuss about you know some uh, questions are there in chat. <clears throat> <clears throat> have you done the walk yet, GP? I haven't done yet. I'll do it tomorrow. Looked at it yet. It took complete week eight. <clears throat> I'm like getting very confused. I'm like struggling with DBMS.
just focus on their you know mock and their revisions as well I have oh, it, I have so much to memorize, yeah, in DBMS. There's just too, also, very, too much of theory here. Memorizing also, yeah. yeah. No, there's nothing it's all so very tough. Even I haven't started MLT yet. No, you're talking about MLT or No, no, no I'm talking about DBMS. DBMS, yeah. I also yeah, so DBMS is just, uh, you know, focus on their uh, revision session and mock. I missed the revision sessions. You're saying uh, revision sessions are for mock only, da? Yes, mock and revision. Yes, you can say yeah. yeah, never miss revision session for DBMS. That is yeah. only important. They conduct in lectures, you won't understand anything actually. They conduct one or two mock sessions, so those are really helpful. Yeah. So I'm what going to watch them. I watched what, the lecture what, today. What to memorize Uma in DBMS? I think uh, no, there are theory parts, completely theory, right? There's too many. Can, can we finish this one? Yes, yes, please, sir. We were yes, waiting sir, for you. We were, yes, we were waiting for you. Okay, sorry for the disturbance. So, so I think we are done with the week eight as well. Like, uh, I think if you don't have any questions, we are done with week eight. I have a question from graded assignment of week eight. Can I share the screen? Yeah, please. This is. I didn't understand how exactly this was done. Are you able to see my screen? Not yet. Sir, your screen is still showing here. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Now it will show. Share. Oh. This question. This eight. So you have to uh, you have Consider to find the specification data set contain yeah. uh, containing two features F1 and F2. F1 is a categorical features with which can take three values, right? Yeah. And F2 is numerical that follows the Gaussian distribution. And how many parameter you need to estimate the other than IPS algorithm in the same data set? Okay. So so you have binary classification. So one for the distribution of label, right? Correct. And if you if they talk about the Gaussian Gaussian distribution, I mean the second feature, so mm -hmm. that that will be mu zero and sigma zero, right? Correct. Uh, two two from there. Now for first feature, first feature can take three values, right? Yeah, okay, it can okay. take three. Here, here for F two again, mu zero, mu one, and sigma zero. Uh, sigma sigma you have to calculate three three parameter parameters there, right? Yeah. Because the covariance we are assuming to be same for both the distributions. Right. Okay, so three there, one there, and for first feature you have three, it can take three values. Right, so so you have to calculate two and two for class zero, two for class one. Four, right? Four plus mm -hmm. one more remaining. So nine, how is nine? Four plus four. Answer should be eight, I think. Okay, so is... this answer is incorrect. Yeah. Okay. The answer should be eight. Answer should be eight, isn't? It? Okay. Yeah. Can oh, I explain I... again? Yeah, please. So can you solve it, sir? Like mean on some white page, so yeah. it will be easy for us to relate. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Give me one minute. Should I stop sharing? Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll just show you one more thing that I saw here. The solution actually shows nine. Yeah, because they are uh, they are using mu zero, uh, sigma one. zero and sigma one, na? In our case, sigma zero and sigma one are the same. No, the correct answer is eight, not not nine. Yeah, in this solution, it is mentioned sigma zero and sigma one in the last second line f for feature uh, two. Ah, see that. Okay. That's why it's nine. I think this oh. is from last year or last term. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to make the correction. Immediately. So this is in the solution PDF, right? Okay, I'll correct yeah. in the re-upload it. It should be okay. sigma only. Yeah, the uh, uh, explanation in this one is quite understandable. So I don't think there should be any problem. But sir, you should definitely help the other students. Yeah, and in the even the question statement is not mentioned that the sigma sigma is sigma is same or. Yeah, in that's I think the previous uh, previous terms questions I think yeah. so you should just update. From there I directly post it here. So <laughs> okay.
will you be solving it now or yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. week 7 or week 6 also that problem somebody asked in the beginning okay uh, so here in this case you need to estimate p right that is probability of y equal to 1 uh, and another thing that you need to estimate is for feature second you have to estimate mu 0 and mu 1 and sigma right three three estimate उट Given taking value one, given y equal to zero, and p f two, f one taking value two, given y equal to zero. Third one is automatically you will find this. This will be one minus this thing and this thing. So two estimate this one, and two four f two taking value not f two, f one taking value one, uh, given y equal to one, and uh, p f one taking value two, given y equal to zero. And third one is automatically will be one minus all these things, right? So, so two. Four estimation, four estimation here, and two, three estimate here, and one estimate here. So total eight estimate you need to do. Right? Is it clear now or not? Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, practice assignment. I am just searching for it. Just give me one second. Uh, uh, sir, I have one. ओके Is there a formula for the naive one? D, na D plus D, just D. D minus one, isn't it? Yeah, D minus. In the case of naive, you have to just uh, understand the thing that the features are independent. Uh, you know the class conditional independence. That is what is happening. So. Uh, what is yeah. this formula? D minus one. So they're talking about, I think, the two-part D, as Ravi said. I think that is for the the base theorem, na? No? Yeah. If if one one only naive base, so two raised to the power D plus one, right? Minus one. My two raised to the power D plus yeah, one raised... minus one. That is just when they are not independently distribution. Yes, so, There's no so there mention is, of independence. There it is. Two raised to the power D. Two raised to the power D. Here, which formula was used? Here, just the concept of that was used. Uh, you have to just remember if naive is mentioned, you have to uh, understand that the uh, the features are independent. It looks like it's almost like you know two into d minus one. Two bracket d minus one. Yeah, I I understand what you're saying, but uh, here the features are not uh, zero one kind of na. No? Yeah, so that that formula only applies for Bernoulli naive base. Here, yeah. the features are features second features are your Gaussian, right? So Gaussian what Gaussian. what she's saying is correct. You can create a formula depending yeah. on how many levels yeah, yeah, F takes, course, yeah, yeah. right? You can create a formula, but it's just easier to remember it this way. This way, yeah. You can go step but, by step. Uh, it's easy to do. Pra practice assignment seven. I don't know if the other person is asking the same thing. Mm -hmm. Practice assignment week seven, question six. Uh, Maybe Karthik will be able to help. Uh, week one, week one, week six. Practice assignment seven, week seven, question number six. Somebody asked earlier also. I was also struggling with this question. Uh, okay. So and week seven, practice assignment. And I want uh, five also, like uh, finding the boundary, uh, seeing like. Week five. I mean, week seven. Fifth question. 
what was is asking a sixth question i'm also asking for the fifth question okay uh five and six is it five yeah and six. four and five are together actually six mm -hmm. is a separate one so what can you say about the predicted labels okay let me copy this question first Okay, so this is five, right? Yes. So what is the question? The simply is partitioning this, uh, partitioning the feature space into four regions. And what can you say about the predicted labels of points that fall in the four regions? What is the tree? Actually, half of the part of this question is above this this question. Yes, no? the tree is posted up in the ah, yeah. previous page. Okay. With the tree. You are able to hear the sound is maybe okay. Yeah, so that's, this is the tree. Hmm. So the tree is six less than three. Uh, y greater than two is R one. And uh, yeah, so see you, you. The question is. So basically, you want to associate each leaf with a label, right? Mm. So you have to remember one thing. Each region, each rectangular region into which you partition the space is associated with exactly one leaf. So for example, if you look at x less than 3, so x less than 3 is this vertical line, right? Everything to the left of this vertical line is x less than 3. Mm. Yes. So this could be R1 or R2, but then you ask a question, why greater than 2? So if y greater than 2 is true, then you are going to call that minus 1. So y greater than 2 will correspond to actually region 1, right? Y greater than 2, OK, yes. Right, so R1, so we can say that R1, R1 corresponds to the leftmost leaf, and mm. uh, that happens to have label minus 1. Right, so that is how you decide R1, and if Y is less than or equal to two, then it's R2. Right, so you're still so you're zero. still in X less than three regime. So you're either looking at R1 or R2. So R2 will have plus one, plus one. Right, so it'll have plus one. Oh, R. So once you come to once you have finished this side of the branch, you go to the other branch. So. This is x greater than or equal to 3. So it could be either r3 or r4. Now, since y less than 4 is r3, r3 is plus 1. Okay. So r3 is uh, plus 1, and r4 is minus 1. OK. Yeah, r4 is minus 1. OK. OK. Yeah, so that is that question. Now, what is the other one? The next one, sixth one. One is uh, sixth one is an independent question, right? So it is yeah. consider the following data set. We consider the following data set. As I create. Data points are missing, but yeah, anyway. Yes, yeah, so what is the question asking? Is the following decision three cleanly separates the two classes such that the leaves are pure? Q1 is of the form less than B. So I probably need to show the data. Yeah, that pure, that pure part is what I'm not able to understand. What do they mean by pure? The Y label has to be pure, or what has to be pure? The leaves have to be pure, right? So in this case, there's a decision stump. So there are only, there's only a question followed by two leaves, right? Yeah, yeah. if I plot those data points, you, you, okay, so just plot those data points. 
if you can just mm -hmm. plot them on despots or something i think this is the you can plot them here itself so okay. yeah let's plot them here itself so what are the uh, what are the points can you tell me what the points are one second uh, Two comma uh, two, one. Two, two comma one. Okay, two one. Ten zero. Okay, let's do all the ones first. Uh, how many ones are there? Uh, okay, two one. Okay, minus minus four, four one. Yeah. Zero one. Zero one. So these are all positive class. So let's. Yeah, that's the y is the positive class. Okay, now ten okay. zero. So actually, one one just one point. So th this is actually not a two D data, right? I'm plotting it in two D just for convenience, right? Yeah, it's okay. one so you can we can treat the Y label as whatever. Yeah. So what are the negative points? One second. Uh, ten zero. Okay. Eight zero. Eight zero. Nine zero. Okay. So it should be. Uh, okay, so this is uh, this. So that's this. This is the data set, right? So all these belong to one, and this belongs to zero. So question is asking, how many? Uh, yeah, how many positive integer values can we take? So if the question is x less than v, then x less than two is ruled out, right? It's not yeah. a valid question. So four, that four is, five, six, seven. Yeah, three, four, five, six, three, seven. Four, eight, six, three, seven. four, five, six, seven. seven. And also, eight, also. eight right? Why, why we should take it? X less than eight is In not similar to eight is valid, no? Than equals okay. Eight. okay, okay, okay. So uh, I'm not understanding. Can someone explain? I'm not getting. Okay, do, do you understand the difference between X less than eight and X less than equals to eight? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, what's the question? I'm not getting the question in the first place. So you, you, have, uh, you have to determine the goodness of the question. Basically, x less than v. So we have to insert a value that is good enough so that oh, so all the... Separate it. Okay. Yeah, there oh, is purity okay. in the left. Uh, yes, leave. Yeah, got it. Okay. So the so how, many is, such, how many such values are there? Integral. Okay. Four, six like that, right? Yeah. Got it. Sorry. Uh, that was, that I was confused as to what it meant by purity. Is it the Y label? Uh, yeah. Purity of the leaves, right? So the entropy being zero. So the only only labels, only data points having label zero or only data points having label one. Yeah, yeah. See, if I, yeah, yeah. So first I thought that these are two D points, so there is no way of actually the only line which can classify is uh, along. Parallel to x-axis, right? So I was confused. I mean, uh, uh, you got what I'm saying, Karthik sir. I treated yeah, it yeah. as 2D data point. So I was not sure how to segregate this. Like it can't right. be a value; it is a straight line. Ah, right. Yeah. Yeah, but then if y is the val label, then it's fine. Then I understood. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one question on that. Um, yeah. Less than or equal to eight. Okay, we will consider, but one of the points is listed as uh, zero, right? Eight comma zero is listed as uh, zero. So Why eight label? comma zero, the zero is the label, right? Uh, so one, it's like we should, we should actually be plotting this on the number line, right? Not on the two D plane. It's actually ah, on okay. the number line. Okay. Uh, but yeah. So what is the question? Eight comma zero. Question, if eight comma zero is to be considered as positive, then eight comma zero is already listed as negative. Was what I was wondering. Eight comma zero is negative by design, right? So according to the question, eight comma zero is a negative data point. Okay, just let me see the data. So less than eight will less than eight will work. Yes, it will. Uh, less than equal to eight will not work. So. Yes, it won't <laughs> because less than eight. Considers all the point till seven point nine 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 nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's and not, but not eight. That's it. Okay. So, oh, sir, are we having more? 
Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, we'll discuss that. So let's. So Nitin, let's talk. I have had Sorry. the number of sessions we are having. I think we should just continue 24 hours. We <laughs> just finish up till the exam. So for the above question, Karthik, we have to plot and answer. That is the only possible way, right? Uh, plotting is more convenient, but we, how can we come up with that answer? Because x less than d, we have to uh, plot only by you plotted. It is very easy to look at. How do we yeah. come up? That is only. Uh, Right. No, you, you, it's not necessary to only plot, right? One, one see, yeah, the, the algebraic way of solving it is you sort all the points in ascending order of feature value, right? And there will be a cutoff between positive and negative. So, for example, here, if you sort them according to feature value, minus 4, minus 2, 2, minus 4, minus 4, 0, 2, 8, 7, 10, or whatever, like that, right? Okay. So, you will notice that. Uh, the first three of them are green and the rest of them are red, right? So between the last green point and the first red point, how many integer values are there? Okay. Yeah. It will tricky, yeah. It is. yeah. So shall, shall I stop the streaming? Okay. How many data points we can fit? Okay. That is understood, but I'm still stuck at 808 eight is listed as zero. But yeah, when we just... count eight as the cutoff and we say greater than that or rather less than that is always going to be one then i have a conflict isn't it eight is listed as both zero and one there eight is no eight is a negative data point right i got correct, the true label is minus one uh -huh. so what we are saying is i can three four five six seven that is the only additional ones you are counting then three four three four five six seven and eight also right because my the kind of question i'm asking is it's less than so Oh, okay. Right, so that uh, even though this this line is a part of the line belongs to the green class, if you will. Yeah. If the question was x less than or equal to v, then we can't take it. Yeah. Oh, okay. But we can take two. Right? Then we can take two. The number final answer will be the same, but we yeah. can't take eight. We can take two. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, right. So I think let's stop streaming now. Sir. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. yeah.